Arts Open Communities and Adult Education, and uh, and uh, former former dean of our faculty. Now I remind you that this activity is uh, under the aegis of the UNESCO Chair in Global Adult Education. We are hello Margaret, hello Ruben, hello Chris. We are now um, people are joining. Hello Rob. Okay, uh, we are now. I can see Ira Shore there as well. Hi, Naisa, Aksoy. Okay, uh, 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 these are the people I know, actually. Now, Alessio is in as well. Uh, there's Maria Harminia from, from Brazil, from Brazil, who presented yesterday. Ali Abdi is here. Okay. Here is the great man. Here's Ali. So, I can hand over to Carmel. Uh, <laughs> Okay, this is under the ages of the UNESCO Chair in Global Adult Education. So we are focusing in the centenaries of people who have made a great contribution to adult education, but we are expanding the discourse. You know, Frey is more than just adult education. Raymond Williams is more than adult education. Just to remind you, Friday the 10th, we have a similar one like this, smaller, of course, on Raymond Williams, who uh, this is his 100, year, 100 years from his birth. Um, and we'll be having, we'll be, next year we'll be celebrating uh, Julius Nerere, who is connected with adult education, but we'll also have other activities, not just celebrations of centenaries. So, uh, Carmen, over to you. Sure. Uh, thanks, uh, Peter. First of all, from my uh, uh, geographic position, it's a good evening to everyone. And uh, welcome to this uh, third and final day of a three-day uh, <coughs> Um, I've been invited by uh, both Joe and uh, Peter to, uh, you know. Uh... Um, Carmen, you switched off your microphone. Uh, so I've been invited by uh, both Joe and Peter to chair this uh, first session of the third day under the banner of uh, political, pedagogical approaches, concepts and uh, philosophies. I, of course, um, uh, accepted uh, Peter and Joe's, you know, uh, invitation uh, with, uh, with, with gladness uh, for two reasons. First of all, the four, you know, um, uh, speakers who would be speaking under this banner are all persons I highly respect and highly regard. And uh, of course, uh, secondly, because they've all inspired me in my 34 year journey as an educator as an administrator, as an activist, and of course, as an academic. Um, the first speaker of uh, this evening is uh, Ali Abdi. Ali Abdi is professor of uh, social development education in the Department of Educational Studies at the University of British Columbia in uh, Vancouver. His interests, research interests, you know, range from citizenship and human rights education to international development education, multi-centric philosophies and methodologies of education, post-colonial studies in education, social and cultural foundations of education. Um, Ali, Abdi, uh, Ali Abdi's presentation uh, this evening is uh, um, uh, entitled, um, uh, okay, the uh, uh, onto-epistemological and pedagogical inter intersections of Frerian and Ubuntu philosophies of uh, education. And uh, of course, with a lot of um, epistemological humility, Ali, I dare say that uh, this is a presentation about the intersection of uh, Frere's claim that, uh, you know, the ontological vocation of all human beings is to become more human. That's, you know, uh, Frere's uh, uh, side. And uh, uh, on the other side, there's the Ubuntu uh, philosophy with the idea that the ultimate goal should be to become a full person, a real self, or a genuine human being. And I see a lot of intersection, you know, uh, between these two, uh, you know, ideas. But it's up to you, Ali, to elaborate on uh, this intersection. Ali. Thank you so much, uh, Carmen, uh, Carmel. I uh, really very happy. I'm very happy to see a lot of you know colleagues like Carmel and want to again thank you Peter and also other colleagues who are from other places. Uh, 
and it's really, really wonderful to, to participate in this. I also want to thank you uh, and, and also Donaldo who will be speaking uh, for you know, giving me the, the opportunity to speak first today uh, because I have to rush about 30, 40 minutes from now to a debate defense, which as you know, the world is now working in, in ways and intersectionist that is, that's a little bit complicated. So you are calling upon something that it's not have been on your plate and sometimes you have to respond. So I will uh, try to uh, take the 15 minutes and not go beyond it as much as I can. Uh, so uh, I am one of those people who, as a graduate student long ago in, in Montreal, read right. the pedagogy of the oppressed. And as remarkably the case is now, and without any much changes, I was impressed. Uh, by the not only by the uh, message that Freire was sharing in that book, but by the terminology, the the, the construction of the of the uh, expressive style that he was uh, and, and conveying, and so on and so forth, and uh, I felt a sense of connection immediately. And interestingly, when I ask his students, the ones who are in my classes now, in 2021, what is what is this you know unique connection that you are so much excited about this, they express the same thing. They, they say that this is actually more or less what I feel this moment, what I think about the world, how I see education, how I see uh, human rights, how I see epistemic and ontological liberation, and so on and so forth. So with that, and with that incredible consistency of the power of the message of Ferrari from 19, uh, thinking, 1960s to now, I would say the following, with remarkable cons consistency, Freire's work from the pedagogy of the oppression to his posthumously published pedagogy of indignation widely engages active and effective perspectives that centrally in both discur discursive and multi-level instructional terms, conveys the importance of our interactions in the context of his social, of the social, the cultural, the, the, the political, and by extension, the economic. With that, Ferreira's work actually set weight his people's lives, needs, and, and expectations in a way that's immediate, that is uh, conceptual, that is analytical, that is uh, critical. So you feel some a sense of connection in that way because the way the way the world is today, or the world, the way the world has been, incidences and clusters and systems of injustice have been imposed upon billions and billions of people with a B. And it is actually through Ferrer's thought clusters conveyed in a language that seems to connect so well with the person who is receiving that message that also connectively explains for me his overall, overall connection with African Ubuntu philosophies of life and Ubuntu philosophies of education. In African traditional Ubuntu philosophies of life and education, the circularly connected nature of the social with the communal learning and the cultural designs, operations and outcomes are also time is space punctuated these are also continuous throughout, throughout life. And they fit in a semi-circular format with our current understanding of what we may call lifelong education, global adult education, continuing education, and so on and so forth. As such, the epistemic as well as the epistemological relationship between Freire and, and Ubuntu one philosophies of education should be both thickly attached to the process of humanization, which in manners, which in manners that could be more interstitial than otherwise, bring together these active perspectives and practices of being, living, learning, and teaching. In their most generalized renderings and prospects, Ubuntu philosophies with their cultural situatedness and utilities, note, advance, the interhuman between humanist notion and practice of comprehensively seeing our humanity 
through the humanity of the other. I'm taking that actually expression directly from uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, meaning that in feelings, needs, behaviors, and outcomes, we are the person who is to us the other. So how do we actually understand that context and connect ourselves to, to that uh, interestingly humanistically interconnected or interconnecting space? As such, perhaps the thickest ideational and practical connection is between, uh, between Freire and Ubuntu philosophers is their commitment is to inclusive humanization and horizontal liberation intentions and commitments. So with that understanding and just your know, general background, how do we then situate and currently see this uh, at this centennial uh, moment? Uh, so I would say that uh, Freire's system shaking works, not shattering yet, but system shaking works are not only as important as ever, but with impressive, forceful, temporal inertia, maybe even more popular in some spaces and in some contexts, and based on our needs now than before. In informally chatting with colleagues at different universities, for example, in Canada and elsewhere, uh, I see how Freire's work seems to be referenced and discussed probably as much as ever if not more. And how do we understand that? How do we feel that? How do we react to that? Uh, yes, that's great and wonderful. But as some of the discussion is I had also indicated, there is also the potential uh, and widespread sometimes, uh, and less than practical admiration plus readings of his work, especially his pedagogy of the oppressive and it is conceptually and thematically embedded construct slash perspective of conscientization or conscientious or so. Now, conscientization sounds nice. It, it just sounds good when you, when you say it. And in many cases, actually, people have been running around with it because it's just something that looks novel and, 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 and even exotic and to an extent. I do remember, by the way, reading a work by Margaret Leftwoods about 20 years ago, who said actually that the, the, the translation of conscientious soul to conscientization is not right. It's actually, she said, it's, it's not actually complete. Yeah, and actually the one that will be closer to, to that will be, she used the, 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 the French expression, uh, I think, brise de conscience, uh, in the sense that she said, uh, by the way the Anglo-speaking world uses conscientization actually, they are more or less practicalizing the point without necessarily understanding the deeper ontological construction connections of, of conscientious soul. So there is, a, the admiration has to be taken with a tiny, I think, ounce of, 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 of suspicion in the sense that sometimes people actually may not, may not fully uh, comprehend what the intention is are, but may just say, okay, this sound is good, it sounds great, you know, and everybody's talking about conscientization. I think it's something to talk about and something to, to, to understand, but I think the admiration and the locatedness of it also says a lot about, especially for those of us who need to read more of, 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 of Freire's uh, 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 work. So with that, uh, and, and I would also say that it's extremely important, therefore, to understand the, at this centennial moment, Ferreira's work, not only in the way it has been uh, constructed and deployed in Latin America, but also how it has influenced uh, a lot of people around the world. Uh, oppression has, uh, or, or when people are marginalized and oppressed, the characteristics can be more or less uh, intersectional, <laughs> if I can use that term, uh, in the sense that they can actually intersect. And uh, when uh, Freire was talking about the, 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 the marginalized in, or, or the 
people who are uh, pushed to the, to the, to the fringes of, of, of life in Latin America, he was also by extension talking about the others around the world who were also exposed to this uh, complicated and, 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 and oppressive systems. So it's, it's with that in, in mind that we also at this time need, in my opinion, uh, in fact, an operationalized uh, in our analytical and critical perspectives, uh, how actually Freire's work also, uh, for me at least, and based on my limited reading and limited understanding, by the way, uh, by borrowing from the for a few uh, ideas, maybe not necessarily uh, directly from Gramsci, for example, and others, uh, another socio-cultural uh, slash economic scholars, the work should be shared as analytically complementing also the work is of other anti-oppressive, if extra Brazil or extra Latin America liberation thinkers. For this purpose, we can look at the work is inter alia of Franz Fanon, MSSR, Edward Said, Chinua Achebe, Julius Nerere, who I am glad Peter said will be will be the, the, the topic of the, of, the, uh, of the UNESCO chair next year. And Amilcar Cabral uh, and, and, and others. These liberation scholars were with Freire and among themselves cross-continentally connected via their all two important onto-epistemological attachments with oppressive populations, with their workers, uh, or via their workers, thus, thus naturalistically responsive in the tradition is of, like Ferrere, the committed, engaged intellectual who do not only speak about, not speak about, but actively work with those who are yearning for freedom and well being. So, based on those uh, few uh, observations, uh, we can then talk about the Freirean and Ubuntu philosophical and pedagogical intersections. It is from the socio-pedagogically descriptive, then transformative platforms and attached analytical angles that one should sense the foundational onto epistemological and pedagogical liberatory possibilities that should be connectively derived from and connected together the Ferreri and Ubuntu philosophies of education. With both situationally and critically responding to the wider and simultaneously active interconnections of differently located but inter-enriching social contexts, both Ferreri and Ubuntu philosophies of education are counter-oppressive analytical platforms that actively seek to be inclusive. So in, in their humanization intentions and so aspired for potential outcomes. Here I'm staying with the humanization, especially, and liberation points. I think that's where the connection is undoubtedly the, the, the strongest for me. As such, the discernible relationship between Freire uh, and, and, and I could also say actually the discernible plus pragmatic relationship between Freire and Ubuntu philosophies of education is in multiple readings. Uh, multiple readings, I should say, even thinker than one might have imagined, with the focus on lifelong learning, selectively punctuated by specialized adult education learning platforms in, in Ubuntu-based traditional African education. Ferrere as the critical pedagogy adult education and theorist par excellence would recognize so much of his work in the Ubuntu philosophies and traditional ways of learning in the African context. Attached to this also is Ubuntu's lifelong enhancement intentions of people's subjectivities as clearly implicated, as clearly implicated in it is person community socialization context that does not detach itself from the immediate situation and the needs of the lone subjective person or that of multiple subjectivities and certainly intersubjective existentialities. This understanding should assure us 
Ubuntu's elemental connection to Ferrarian socio-pedagogical liberatory contributions, where, as led with note, note, notes, the effects of his message never forsook or left or abandoned people's subjectivities with both his, both his message and practice, impressively and with, with deeper implications connecting with people. Both his message and practice, as I said, were impressively and with deeper implications. And that's, I think, one of the reasons also that we admire Ferrer's practical uh, uh, world uh, with, with people's needs and, 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 and immediate yearnings for freedom and, and achievement and social well being. With that reading of, of Freire, therefore, Ubuntu as a social philosophy also. And these thick lines of education represent something that's akin, connected, I should actually say more, to Freire's insistence on reading the theoretical into the practical. Reading the, the theoretical into the practical, thus not disavowing, actually capable of acquiring some entitlement to the practical, that African Ubuntu philosophies of education can make a claim on the practical. Here, the emergent or in more socialistic terms, the humanizing and humanizing intersections, even intersectionalities, as both comprehensive, as both comprehensively look and react to the life and learning based com commissions and omissions of, of the social and related contexts existentially ingrained responsive potentialities of Freirean and Ubuntu philosophies of education should not be missed. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Ali, can you conclude because we are running out of time. Okay. Uh, let me uh, just size perhaps. Uh, paragraph then. So very quickly, in addition and sort of conclusively, I should say, Freirean liberation philosophy and pedagogy are totally, I, would, I am claiming actually, of liberation and humanizing perspective and intention. So are Ubuntu philosophies of education, both in their focus on the individual and on their focus on the uh, community. Together, therefore, Freirean and Ubuntu philosophies of education offer counter hegemonic, contemporaneously operationalized, operationalized, futuristically harnessable systems of teaching and learning that can also multi-epistemically construct something much better than the current neoliberalist and still colonialist schemes of education. Uh, thank you, Ali. Uh, I know you uh, have to go, so um, perhaps we will take uh, one or two questions uh, before we move on to uh, uh, Donaldo Macedo questions or uh, uh, comments or reflections from you know the uh, the group. Questions, statements, uh, reflections. Like to, uh, reflect. Margaret, yes, thank Margaret. You. And I'd like to say thank you, Ali. This really spoke to my heart. And um, I'm just so interested in what you've got to say about the intersections. I spoke on feminist intersectionality yesterday um, and the links with becoming fully human. Mm. I think it, keeping it brief, because I know we've got to, there's much I'd like to open out here. But um, I think that what I'd like to say most of all is um, three dimensional thinking which is what we need for intersectionality, and we mm. repeatedly talk about it, um, is li links most profoundly to indigenous thinking and to intuitive thinking, the thinking of women. And I speak for women because I always find myself in the minority. I'm listening to the wisdom of so many men that contribute to us. Where are the women thinkers? In an age when um, misogyny and violence against women is becoming just totally unacceptable and women are rising. So that's the backdrop to what I'm saying. Um, I think that uh, what we're saying most strongly is that Western consciousness is founded on linear, um, simplistic, either or binary thought. And we have not got the intersectional 
intellectual tools to deal with what Ali's talking about without us investigating and claiming indigenous and intuitive, women's intuitive thought. So I'd just like to throw that into the mix. Great. Any other comments, uh, statements, reflections, questions, please? Um, For one. If I can, yes. if I can uh, throw cool. in um, yes. one sort of a statement question, and it's about the nature of the individual. Because one of the things, um, and I really appreciate uh, Ali's presentation, I, I've, I'm going back to articles about Ubuntu now, because I haven't thought about it for a while pointedly. So thank you. Um, and one of the things about Ubuntu, though, is that it foregrounds um, what we could call interbeing. I mean, one of the popular conceptions or, or ideas of Ubuntu is the, the translation into English of I am because you are. Um, and it's, an, it's, a, it's a philosophy of interbeing. So, so beyond just intersection, and I'm a big fan of intersectionality, and it's so great to see you, Margaret. Um, the, uh, the notion of interbeing strikes me as, as really important in this moment of, of the pandemic when so many people are opposing um, safety measures based on notions of individual liberty, you know, and Ubuntu suggests something different about the individual. And, and I'm a bit of a collector um, and, as a researcher and, and I've collected a bunch of notions or learned about a bunch of notions like Ubuntu. Um, and since you're in BC, one of those notions comes from the New Channels people of the West Coast of Vancouver Island. Um, my son is a member of the New Channel First Nation. And they have a notion called Hishuk Ishtsawak. And that translates as all things are one and interconnected, very similar to Ubuntu and amongst as apropos of Margaret's comment about indigenous ways of knowing, there are many indigenous terms around the world that are equivalent or related to Ubuntu from the notion of the Ganma amongst the Yongu in Northeast Australia, North East Australia or Metakuye Oyasin amongst the Lakota in what is today the United States. So my question or comment really is to, 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 to be critical of what we even call an individual today um, mm -hmm. and how that, you know, sort of creates a condition or limits to how we are able to talk about um, education and freedom. One last note, just because Raymond Williams yeah. is coming up. Raymond Williams points out in his uh, keywords that the word individual prior to the 17th century was synonymous with indivisible. And after the 17th century, the individ individual came to be known as that which is separated from. So Ubuntu seems to me to challenge that and is a wonderful thing to connect with Freire's work. Great, thanks, Chris. Uh, thanks, Ali. I should like to thank you uh, uh, profusely for bringing in so much decolonized knowledge into the equation into the four and good luck with the rest of your day. Thank you so much, Alice. And I wanna also mention quickly, maybe I wanna thank uh, Don Aldo for allowing me to be go first. I think it's a good uh, gesture from one African to another. So I wanted to thank you, bye-bye. Thank you once again, Ali. Uh, the, next, so the next speaker- good to see everybody looking sure. forward to other conversations. Thank you. So the next- and needs no introduction. Uh, his work in uh, translating and editing works of Paulo Freire, uh, his published dialogues with Freire and his own research on Freire's pedagogy need no uh, introduction. We're referring to Donaldo Macedo, uh, University of Massachusetts at Boston. Uh, and uh, his presentation today is entitled Freire's use of Boniteza as a political act. I understand that Boniteza refers to beauty. Donaldo. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, congratulations, Ali. We didn't prepare or coordinate our speeches, but uh, we coincide in many ways, maybe because we, we are both Africans. But one of, the, one of the things that struck me in his speech is the role of language and how Freire uses language you know, with deficiency and effectiveness. 
And also prayer is refused till many, many, many years uh, after the proposal of conscientization to have it translated into English for a number of reasons. The one being that he says, you know, uh, he he's, he's forced, so he has accepted the use of stress and he uses it all the time. I'm stressed, estou pressado. And, uh, uh, and then why not Americans or English speakers uh, try to struggle with conscientization, not as a literal translation, but what he had in mind is precisely what Ali mentioned. It, conscientization means so much more than the translation of conscientization happens to be. Third, I feel I'm going to be a little bit critical of what I call pseudo uh, uh, Freudians. Uh, because, you know, the lack of the individuals or current philosophies, ideas that made Freire who he became. You can't understand Freire without understanding Fanon. We cannot understand Freire without understanding Mammy. You cannot understand Freire without understanding Césaire. And he has a brilliant chapter who is hardly read on Amilcar Cabral, and he happened to to lead the cane, literacy campaign in Guinea-Bissau, and that where he basically mentions, uh, he talks about the, the, the beauty of Cabral's revolutionary plan is because it was first and foremost a pedagogical revolution. So uh, Freire's depth often is not really captured in our necessity or zeal to, to um, to, to be on stage always and then and the way we are overworked. But let me begin that, but also I wanted to say that my critique of pseudo Freudians does not at all include any of the colleagues who are now with me. I have admired you for many, many years, work and collaborated, but I am a little bit, uh, a, a little bit uh, uneasy with the new generations that, uh, that think that the past uh, is no longer viable, and it's very hard for me to conceive of a future without a present that's linked to the past. So again, thank you for creating this virtual, uh, to all of you, creating this virtual platform so we can collectively celebrate Paulo Freire's anniversary. But although I welcome celebration about Freire in all dimensions, I think we should go beyond celebration. We should really use this forum and add the forum as a process uh, to recommit ourselves to the work that needs to be done precisely as uh, Ali mentioned, uh, the world has become uglier, much uglier. The mm -hmm. racism is on, in, on your face, so to speak. The, 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 the women, as they are uh, ascending, they are much more abused and dismissed. Mm -hmm. And so the intersection, you know, uh, it, we need not to, to, to call uh, for the need of, uh, of the, the, the um, of our understanding of the interconnection of these various factors. So while celebration is always welcome, as I have mentioned, we should remain also very vigilant so as not to be caught with our activists and academic pants down. By that I mean, it is naive to think that oppression ended with the publication of Freire's classic book, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Far from it, you know. Even so, even worse, in my view, is the naivete, uh, uh, is the self-proclaimed Freirean who often frees the, his limitless hope by circumscribing Freire's ideas and ideals into a crass careerism that attempts to iconize Freire in a populist posture that throughout his life he rejected and sometimes very aggressively so. As a translator, you know, I, I had to have multiple conversation about the issue at hand. So the attempt to use Freire as a launching pad for a crass careerism invariably locks the pseudo Freudian into a very undeniable, undeniable embrace of the capitalist 
zealotry of to have. That's another thing. We cannot understand the Freire unless we engage in an anti-capitalist capitalist analysis. Hence, the crass careerists willfully sacrifice, sacrifice Freire's ideas and ideals that reside in also his important notion of to be, meaning the expansion of our humanity. On the contrary, the prof professionalized Freudians often disguise their colonial appropriation as experts or benefactors who become anthro anthropological tourists and at times become also assistentialists in they often brief journey, journeys to the Amazon or to Haiti or to Africa, like in a Bissau case in point, Cape Verde, where I come from, and whose careerism depends on the narration of the human misery created by the very extractive structures that they denounce at the level of discourse. That is, professionalized Freudian remain chained into a misguided need to crassly use their comrades, for example, to squeeze yet another publication so as to fatten their resumes, or to fight over who, who should be the first or second author of a particular publication, given you know, the myriad or the challenge that we have before us, that according to Noam Chomsky, among others, if we don't do something about the oppression about the, the green technology, about the global warming, we may not be here you know, to, even, to even enjoy the status that we may accumulate through the many books that we write. What the pseudo uh, Freudian also often worry is who, so to speak, will be the righteous carrier of the Freudian torch. Freire never thought about that, that, that he even had the torch. In fact, when he was given an honorary doctorate through my conviviality with him or any, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, uh, medal or, 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 or prize, you know, he would be surprised. He would surprise and then trying, I don't really understand given his humility, you know. What the pseudo then Freire uh, do often is willfully neglect to acknowledge that their, maison, their main raison d'etre has nothing to do with liberation and social justice in the final analysis, but all to do with the perpetuation of a colonial ideology. As you know, I, I sometimes laugh when I read and work with my colleagues, my, 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 my um, my tenures in the English department deal with my colleagues are trying to push into my throat that we are in the post-colonialism and uh, where in my country and many African countries, you know, we continue to feel, you know, the chains of colonialism, you know. So, but moving from that, the colonial ideology needs to be really linked to those, for example, who, uh, you know, eagerly go to Haiti to collect data for their PhD, PhD dissertation, dissertation while making sure that they enjoy the comfort and security of having to stay or wanting to stay in five-star five hotels. While Haitian children, you know, intensify, you know, they hunger as they, as they search for cookies made out of dirt in order to fool their stomach, their stomach that, you know, the hunger that ravaged their emaciated body has at least momentarily disappeared or passed. True Freudians are those like Nita Freire, you, my colleagues in front of me, Henry Giroux, among a handful of others, organic intellectuals and activists. The publication of pedagogy of the, the oppressed should never be viewed as an end of oppression as the arrival of democracy in multiple nations of the world does not guarantee the end of authoritarianism. The race, the current race for far right ideology that we are witnessing all over the world, you know, does not guarantee, does not guarantee, you know, that, you know, democracy is not in peril. 
you know, furthermore, it, it, they represent ways in, we, in which we bear witness, you know, to Freire's counsel, the importance of vigilance of those of us who care about social justice, equality, uh, as part and parcel that those things become part and parcel of any struggle for emancipation to the extent that liberation, there is no liberation without vigilance. And in my view, there is no democracy without conscientization, you know, in the translation, in the current translation. As Nita Freire amply, amply has shown, Freire's brilliance is, lies not in his reading methods, you know, in teaching in 24 hours. He never really thought about that. But in his love for language, and in particular, the Portuguese syntax, which makes him extremely difficult to, to, to translate, but extremely rewarding to do so as well. Consequently, Freire understood the need to go beyond the intellectualist, not the intellectual, the intellectualist verbosity and select term from the people language with whom he could engage in fruitful journey toward a world, as he often said, that is more round, more just and more humane. One such as Nita Freire has brought recently to, uh, to our attention is the loving yet profound word that crosses all classes, gender and racial barriers. The oppressed uh, with whom Freire worked in, Northeast, in the Northeast Brazil and, and from whom he, in, and from whom and with whom he engaged in a co constant co-learning process you know, that led to a more rigorous reading of the world had no problem whatsoever understanding the term boniteza, meaning beautifulness, you know, which is basically uh, our ontological vocation in, in Freire's view. Then as a point of departure, the meaning sharing with people who had been forbidden to read the word, Freire could more easily juxtapose boniteza with its antimon, feiura, meaning ugliness. This obvious distinction, distinction enabled then Freire to make his classic point that as humans, we are all ontologically wired to the, beautif the beautifulness of equality, justice, and humanity. By the same token, conscientization, that the conscientization imbued in Boniteza uh, applied to all people across borders, across you know, uh, uh, boundaries, you know, that, uh, 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 that, it be, that it became less difficult for the oppressed to cut the colonial chain around a mind which had been inculcated with false notions of their, or meaning in my case as an African, of our inferiority, our savageness, and our inhumanity, and our incapacity to learn. I remember one colleague once very pissed at my pronouncements of anti and anti-colonialism in the way we teach literature. And he says, Donaldo, you get it wrong. All we are trying to do is to teach these kids, meaning African-Americans, how to learn. These kids had no problem every day dodging bullets so they can get to the classroom. So this is the type of issues that I think that I would like to open for discussion with you and, 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 and those who are listening to us. Then for me, a critical discussion of Freire, Freire's use of boniteza, meaning beautifulness, as an expression of love, hope, also aesthetics, aesthetics constitute also you know, as much a political act that denounce any and all oppressive forms and acts designed to deny those who have been profiled as other the right to experience 
what it means fully to be fully human. And as he said also, to be fully more human. In this usual preoccupation to create pedagogical space, spaces to enhance conscientization, Freire used Bonitez's antonym, feiura, meaning ugliness, to on the one hand highlight humanity's endowment from nature, the nature, bonitese, and on the other hand, he brilliantly used its antonym, feiura, as the diametric opposite whose major role is the hollowing out of our humanity. As such, feiura in, in, invariably must trigger you know, its aggressive needed denouncement, which the very act of denouncing ugliness becomes, on the other hand, an act of beautifulness, meaning bonitese. So thus they are in dialectical relationship. Hence, bonitese and freyura, as I had mentioned, must be always viewed dialectically uh, in that Freire genially, as he does often with language and thinking, uh, achieve uh, 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 juggles these words and terms in order to facilitate the necessary political clarity that must be achieved in the process of conscientization. So then he used people's words like boniteza and ugliness that they have no problem comprehending to go into step, deeper steps where more important issues, the issues of, for example, conceptualization, you know, would arise in the reading of the world before we even begin to read the world. So such a critical awareness gained through Bonitesa can also be obtained through its opposite, Feyura, if it is used and only if it is used to trigger to denounce oppression which is in itself a form of feiura. Its denouncement then constitutes an act of knowing, which is at the same time beautifulness, meaning bonitese, the process denouncing as such, you know, the both process by denouncing, you know, as such has also what Paolo called, quote unquote, you know, an indispensable morality that we all intellectuals should bear in mind as we engage with the oppressed or the work that we do. Donald, can me, we uh, me, conclude, please? Yeah, I'm going to conclude by saying, by saying that, uh, by saying that, uh, 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 visiting Haiti, for example and the Amazon as anthropological tourist never puts an end to human misery from which pseudo freightings benefit sometimes given their com complicity with the very colonial structures of oppression, oppression that they sometimes biasedly curate in their books, but do nothing actively to change the condition of those who live in the human misery. So let me end by saying, by, by, let me end by saying and by reiterating that to be freighting, or at least to be truly freighting, as we try, strive to be, is to live freightingly. Not an easy task for those of us who know how freighting lived. That is, we need to critically acknowledge that there is no autonomy without humility, that there is no equality without the necessary, and I underline, without the necessary suicide of competitiveness, greed for material accumulation, the bestest of the world, as well as professional status, you know, and there is no Bonitesa, beautifulness of solidarity without the generosity of heart in sharing without having to always do the necessary 
cost analysis. Simply put, Boniteza of being freighting then lies in the recognition that it is a journey, not an arrival point, a journey that requires a pedagogy of listening so we can embrace Antonio Machado's window, wisdom, which states that caminantes no hay camino, travels, travelers, there is no road, meaning also that to live then freightingly it is for us to recommit in the building of the not yet with humility, without careerist crassness, and with much love. Obrigado and thank you. Thank you, Donaldo. Um, perhaps we will spend some time, you know, reflecting uh, on your uh, on your presentation. Let me uh, perhaps share a, a reflection with you. I mean, in the act of knowing, and this has been my personal experience, there is a lot of pain. The act of knowing can lead to depression, can lead to suicide, can lead to conflict. So would you agree with me that there is ugliness in beauty and beautifulness? Yes, that's why he, he, he never used beautifulness without also dealing, we're, doing, we're talking in 15 minutes, but uh, a book just came out that Lila put together on Bonitesa that addressed specifically yeah. your point. Yes, the idea with Freire is the openness to not shut down conversation dialogue, the openness to entertain that in Bonitesa, also in ugliness, you can have these other issues that are necessary to be understood, but what must be done always is to develop the converg a convergent model that links to other ideas of before, Fanon and others, and Gramsci's and others, with us and the future generation that not everybody, but that tend to think that they just discovered Freire and that those not best. But you're absolutely on the money. I agree with you. And the other question would be, uh, Donaldo, from my point of view, uh, by constructing the other as pseudo, isn't that an act of, you know, shutting conversation with the other? I'm not so sure because at a certain point you have to name it. <clears throat> I'm not so sure that we are all Fre Freudian in the same understanding and in the same commitment. That, mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, that position, you know, uh, in fact, I had a discussion uh, because a discussion the other day, so we cannot use anti-vaxxers because we are already putting them in a category, there's no dialogue. And uh, they have no problem in, 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 in castigating those who are working very hard to address the pandemic. So at certain point, you know, language leaks. Language cannot do everything that we want it to do. That's why dialogue is so important for us to refine the rough contours of language, you know, that's why Freire is so, so careful in the selection, the terms he used, that goes beyond, you know, sometimes beyond the very question that he had in mind, you know, only many years later, uh, I, as a translator of Freire for over 17 years, I didn't pay much attention, not the way I'm doing right now, to the notion bonitesa, you know, mm -hmm. but now it has, it has, it has, allowed me to immerse myself into the world of Freire, a world that I translated, but I, 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 I didn't really apprehend uh, in a manner that I should apprehend. But to, to close down dialogue is to dismiss your questions. That's why he has this important book, you know, the pedagogy of the questions. I think That's education true. should begin with that, not with certainty, and he remained until his death, mm -hmm. that our mm -hmm. unfinishedness, you know, is part of, of our uncertainty about the world. Great, Donaldo. Uh, any other questions, statements, reflections? Before we move on to the third speaker. Um, um, just one, one thought occurs to me. Uh, there's so much to think about and, uh, and reread. Boniteza Feuda. Um, really uh, challenges me and I, and I love it. But apropos of Ali's presentation on Ubuntu, I'm wondering if you see any connection between your 
understanding of Boniteza Feyuda through a co- process of conscientia zasao with what Ali was pointing towards with Ubuntu. Um, and, and, and it strikes me that there's something there to... Well, uh, no doubt about it. I'm, I'm so glad that you mentioned, although I was not prepared, you know, uh, I was taken, you know, uh, you know um, happily taken by, by, by Ali's presentation because he, it, it forced me into my roots, the African roots. Uh, uh, and, and also that's the admiration that Paolo had, not only uh, with various, you know, um, what he would call wise men in Africa and those who wrote like Fanon and others, you see. Um, the, 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 uh, uh, the, I would see the two philosophies becoming part what, what Prady always stressed, that we should stress to be, you know, and, 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 and try while we live in the capitalist world, you know, we cannot ignore it, but to not allow us to be, uh, to, be um, uh, um, uh, uh, to be caught, you know, uh, and, and to be seduced, that's the best, better term, to be seduced uh, with the notion of to have at all costs that our ugliness, you know, feuda, you know, emerge without us realizing that in fact we have the capacity as ethical beings to be, to be both ethical and non-ethical. And uh, so, yes, I see those very much. And in fact, I'm going to try to, uh, I want to read more about it. I want, I'm going to uh, try to email him immediately to see because it is through understanding, you know, the indigenous knowledge and you see this more in the green movement, indigenous movement, that the harmony with nature, the understanding of nature, the understanding collectively, you know, uh, uh, is what the world needs today. You know, so rather than like in where I am in Massachusetts, that Puritans were throwing Indian babies out in the air and shoot them for pleasure, and we need to learn that uh, they have so much to contribute, and we are not going to go and contribute by getting the data and then come to the safety of our uh, uh, studies and write about them, but create conditions that they speak with their voices and we have the humility to listen attentively so we can learn from, from, from a history, from a culture that had been silenced you know, for centuries. We have space for one final question before we move on to the third speaker. Any questions, reflections, statements? Uh, can I just add a, a very quick Okay, Margaret, um, carry on. Also, you just threw in a quick reference to anti-capitalism. Mm-hmm. Um, sorry, I've, where's he gone? He's, oh, I'm here. Oh, right, I see you. I'm here. <laughs> I'm seeing you. <laughs> All right. I, I, I'm going to, it's a very complex question, and I'm going to make this very quick. Um, people like Nancy Fraser and her colleagues are talking from um, a, a feminist change to um, the world as we know it, because I'm very concerned with the fact that our dialogue constantly, uh, for me, is stalling on how to do it and not what to do. I am absolutely worried to death about the lack of a counter narrative. And when we talk about anti capitalism, Nancy Fraser and company are talking about. What we have to concentrate on is capitalism cannot be reformed. We've known this for a long time. Mm-hmm. And, and capitalism is anti frarian its, its values are the antithesis of everything Freire stood for. Why are we not coming up with a counter narrative of anti capitalism? Because without that, we can go on critiquing. But until we have a story to put in the place of the one that is, that is destroying us all, we are not going anywhere. Mm-hmm. Full stop. Right, right yeah. on. Thanks, I, 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 I if you were present, I'll give you a hug and, no. uh, as, a, as a brother. You know? I received but it. Because, but, yeah. <laughs> because that's precisely your point in many dialogues had in mind. We have not had the privilege, the fortune to do precisely what you suggest. If we continue to operate within the framing of capitalism and all the critique or reforms, which basically a form to try, the form to basically uh, not transform, 
but to distort reality, then we, are, we, we run the risk, even with the good intentions, of uh, being caught with our academic and activist pants down. Mm -hmm. Now, let me give an example, specifically in your area, and I know many cases, you know, women, and rightly so, they fight because they need time to, to so voices, their voices would emerge, they, uh, so they would participate more, their names, mm -hmm. you know, they become leaders at universities, so on and so forth, but they forget completely that in order to do so, they go back to their com suburban communities or elite communities where to do what they are doing, mm -hmm. the African women, the Latinx women and the Haitian women are there raising their children while abandoning their children because they have nobody else to take care of their own, you know? So we, this is basically one example of that cap, capitalism can eclipse and get us not to see because having a nanny, you know, in, 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 in my world, with, you know, in the literature departments, we don't call them nanny, we call them, uh, um, this, um, there's a, there's a fancy term name, I forget right now. Um, it comes to me right now. But, but anyhow, they, these people, you know, when we are talking about voice for women, voice for minorities, voice for Africans, you know, we have to make sure that we don't, we don't allow the, 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 uh, the, the, the uh, almost sadistic forces of capitalism to basically destroy our capacity to see like Ali mentioned before, to see our humanity on the people that are providing labor so we can have the privilege to even have a voice or to even have a career or to even go to school. Now, these are very complex and it cannot be done, you know, by fragment, fragmenting movements into women's movements, you know, Cape Verdean movements and so on and so forth, but by creating convergence to understand that our major task is one that needs to think and imagine a utopia that comes up with a narrative that is beyond capitalist, capitalism Absolutely. as we know. Thank you, Ronaldo. Um, much appreciated. Um, let's move on to uh, the uh, third speaker, who, like the other two speakers, uh, needs no introduction. He's a major exponent of uh, critical education and together with Frere, he co-wrote A Pedagogy of Liberation. Ira Shaw, are you with us? Yes, here I am. Well, welcome. <coughs> um, Ira will be speaking about, you know, space, uh, situationality, and perhaps responding to a question which I get a thousand times a year on the relevance of rare to the first word context. So the title of Ira Shaw's presentation today is Situationality and Situated Pedagogy, Practicing Frere's Process in a First Word Context. Ira Shaw. Yes, excuse me. <clears throat> the weather turned cold, and um, so my chest is, re is in rebellion. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much. Look, uh, it's been a very wonderful uh, few days, and um, uh, it's something we should do more often is to listen to each other in, uh, in such uh, detail. So um, I'm very grateful to be part of this and thank, thank you. All right, so um, I, I've always been, um, <clears throat> always been in, uh, very uh, taken by uh, uh, a, a, a short section that Paulo put in Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And, and it's in page 72 of the uh, 50th anniversary uh, edition. And it's where he's comparing uh, the uh, the heart or the foundation of um, liberating education to banking education. Here's what he says. He says, <clears throat> he says, in the banking concept of education, knowledge is a gift bestowed by those who consider themselves knowledgeable upon those whom they consider to know nothing, projecting an absolute ignorance onto others, a characteristic of the oppression, the ideology of oppression, negates education and knowledge as a process of, in, of inquiry. <clears throat> the very next paragraph, he says, the raison d'etre of libertarian education, of libertarian education on the other hand, 
lies in its drive towards reconciliation. Reconciliation. Education, and here's the, the sentence that is always uh, way, so feels so weighty, weighty to me. Education must begin with the solution of the teacher-student contradiction. Education must begin with the solution of the teacher-student contradiction. That's a very uh, profound expectation of what we're going to do when we, we try to practice this compelling theory of uh, liberating a liberatory uh, education, that it uh, requires us to accept that the situation that we begin for, with is this contradiction, this conflict between the teacher and student that we inherit from the hierarchies of the of the state of the status quo of capitalist society and so on, that we we are the officers of the institution, and that the uh, the situation is one is uh, always already oppressive, e as soon as we enter the classroom, as soon as the students enter the classroom, and as soon as the teacher enters the classroom, and where do we begin? We now have to consider. Uh, from that theoretical demand that we have to now consider how do we practice reconciliation in everything that we do? Consider how uh, detailed, how um, granular uh, pedagogy is. The pedagogy is um, where do you sit in the classroom or who has the right to speak first, who has the right to write on the blackboard and so on, who must raise their hand, I could go on, but you know, that the institutional pedagogy in formal education is extremely granular. And now if we take this uh, prime principle from Paolo seriously, we, we have to say that the, we, our job is to initiate reconciliation that reverses the teacher-student contradiction and so on. So this has always uh, bedeviled me in the 50 years of uh, teaching that I've been underway because um, the, the theory seems very profound. And I, I keep asking myself, all right, I have to now examine every aspect of uh, curriculum, every aspect of the syllabus of the, of the lesson plan and every, uh, all the social relations of uh, the classroom because what, what's going on is that, um, <clears throat> as Pierre Bourdieu insisted, that uh, schooling is one of the prime, um, formal education is one of the um, prime uh, institutions of, um, of the habitus, as he called it, the habitus, the, the, um, the experience of everyday life through which we are socially constructed as the human beings we, we become. So I accept now that when I enter the classroom, more or less the whole uh, protocol of that, uh, of that practice is part of a habitus of subordination and um, uh, um, propelling a hierarchy uh, forward when I inhabit that space, that space of authority. At the same time, uh, I have to, uh, uh, Paulo says that um, we, we have to, to be qualified as teachers, to, to be thought of as teachers, we have to, we must know something worth teaching so that we can't accept the, the different identity that we do carry into the classroom as intellectuals, as, uh, as teachers, as educators, and so on. And, and so that the, um, the difference, that there is no question that there's a profound difference between the teacher and the teacher and the students. And Paulo insists that we now have to convert the social relations so that we identify students of the teacher and teacher of the students, that these are simultaneously dialectic. That I, that I have to like put in motion at the same time that I try to act out or <clears throat> try to make possible what uh, Paulo insisted is uh, the democratic directiveness, in his words, the democratic directiveness of the teacher, the teacher's responsibility is to democratically direct. And so it's appeared to me over the last uh, 50 years that uh, I'm trying to own authority at the same time that I'm trying to distribute it, which is a, a contradiction of teaching, of pedagogy that is not easy, not easy to navigate, that I have to present myself as somebody who has something worth teaching and who knows a process that is very, very valuable. And at the same time, I have to authorize and uh, instill in students their desire to take charge and to own the process 
and take responsibility for their own learning. I have found this for 50 years very difficult and that it required for me, a, um, as I say, often a tolerance for risk because uh, I'm often making mistakes and I pursue something that doesn't work out. And uh, it also requires for me an openness to uh, experiment as um, as a well as a well as a um, uh, a, a, a um, how should I put it that uh, that uh, I'm um, I'm not afraid to look um, uh, uncertain at a certain moments. I call these in when I write. I I the phrase I use is that these are the discomforts of democracy. That when we make this transition from the current society of capitalism and male male supremacy and white supremacy and um, uh, homophobic uh, heteronormativity, you know what I'm talking about. As if, we, if we're serious about making these transitions, that there, uh, there's going to be a, a lot of discomfort that on, the, on the road to democracy. Uh, so uh, what I, <clears throat> uh, because time is short, I, 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 with, I picked out two other excerpts from Paulo's work that I wanted to read, but time, is too short and then it's too dense and, and I hope you'll forgive me. I'll just tell you where they are there on page 109 <clears throat> in the same 50th anniversary edition where he talks specifically how we must understand human beings, uh, human beings are in a situation. And unless we question and, and uh, invite reflection and critical reflection, we're, we can't get out of that situation that we're in. And the second one is uh, really just as uh, difficult to enact uh, if we if we take um, a, a pedagogy of the oppressed seriously, he says, uh, one must not think that learning to read and write precedes conscientization. That is that uh, there's such a powerful sense among uh, uh, educators that we're all we're all uh, we all come out of professional programs which which help alienate us from our our students, but that we think, okay, look. What you're trying to do, what you're the questions you're asking, the problems you're posing, the activities you're suggesting, and so on. It is a, a radical uh, activity system that does offer us a chance to do something uh, different. But look, my students can't even, they don't even write. They don't know punctuation. They don't know subject verb agreement. They don't know how to paragraph. They don't know what a footnote is. I could go on and they can't read a paragraph and tell me back what the paragraph said. So the first thing we have to do is teach um, these kind of uh, tasks, uh, teach people how to write. And by that, they mean the, the traditional uh, method of uh, grammar and the uh, linguistic uh, things and rhetoric. And we must teach them to read. Then after they get those foundations, then we'll go on to the advanced questions of uh, how do we become different people in a, in a more humane society? So Apollo says, absolutely not. That everything we do in social relations is reproducing those social relations. So we can't teach reading and writing in the traditional manner because they must have this foundation and then go on and say, now let's be liberated together because we will be, uh, we'll be uh, reinforcing the, the habitus of uh, hierarchy and um, of patriarchy and so on in the, in the way we understand uh, uh, the, old fish, the old method of, of reading and writing. So now this re reiterates what I said before, from the minute I entered the classroom, I have to assume that everything that we do either makes us into people who can uh, change society, become change agents, or it, makes it, or it reproduces the, the socialization or the social construction of being that we already, ex already go through in all the other arenas of life. So the classroom school just becomes another another opportunity for the status quo to make us into the, the people who accommodate, uh, accommodate to us. So he says, conscientization occurs simultaneously with the literacy or post-literacy process. In our educational method, the word is not something static or disconnected from, from experience. Okay, so uh, I know there's so little time here. <clears throat> and all of us over the last three days have tried to squeeze every second for every word. So um, I, uh, I'll, I'll try to be as, uh, as quick as possible and as uh, brief in laying this out. What I found all, uh, when, I, when I've gone around for the last 40 or 50 years to, uh, to speak and offer workshops for teachers, that the openness to, to um, uh, pedagogy of liberation 
is um, is much larger than the the ability to practice it. That people are very interested in an alternative way of becoming a humane teacher and to still experience their their professional identity without uh, oppressing any of the students. That there's a is, that this interest is very large, although it's been forced to the margins. We should never mistake it for being small. So that interest is uh, what uh, creates audiences and openings for us to uh, make uh, to uh, de help develop uh, teachers to towards this uh, this critical process. Uh, on the other hand, the uh, the understanding of how to do that is much much smaller. That like because we are already trained in how to do everything that we, we already know about making a syllabus and making a lesson plan and assigning a, a reading a reading list, <clears throat> giving a midterm, giving a final, assigning a research paper, the tutorial in our office for individuals who need this. We have uh, the entire protocol of uh, accepted professional behavior is, is uh, already, already internalized by us. So now we have to expel that, that protocol and then where is the other protocol? Okay, so we have uh, all of us uh, who started in the 70s with this question um, did not have a library of books and uh, reports of experiences to draw upon. So uh, we had to invent ourselves, which is why there was so much discomfort and uh, errors and um, dead ends and so on. And as uh, Peter, Peter Mayo said yesterday, he said uh, he thought that uh, my first book that I wrote that in 1979 that 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 was the hard, that was the most difficult to read and the the least uh, legible of the book that that I, I got better at writing about it as I wrote more more books and um, I think he's right and I think that I didn't I didn't understand what I was doing and I think that's a good place to go to see confusion and disturbance and the, the struggle to like teach myself. What, the, what I was trying to do. And as I aged and got older, I think, and I also worked a number of years with Paolo and uh, traveled with him and listened to other folks speaking that uh, I began to get clearer on what is this all, what is this all, all about? Now that opportunity is so, um, it's such great good fortune that we have to remember as um, projectors of this, this, this very tradition, this, uh, uh, liberatory education that is just generally not available to almost everyone who is in the field who wants to become this kind of educator. So uh, I, and that's why I proposed to Paulo uh, uh, 35, whatever years ago, that um, we should do a, a book together on the questions I hear teachers asking most when I travel around the country doing workshops. So you, of course, you know, every chapter in that book is based on a question that teachers have asked and so on to, to address them. So um, what, what I found myself needing to do is to, um, is to find some uh, memes that were, or phrases that, uh, that, that told us uh, two different things. First, what kind of person are we trying to become when we enter the classroom and are assume the responsibility of professional educator, an officer of the institution in a formal schooling and, um, and, and having to uh, live with the, um, the requirements and the mandates and the restrictions and the limit situations of a, of a formal institution where most of the teachers are. Now, we heard from some folks in the last three days who are teaching in non-formal education. They teach adult education or, or community-based organizations or freestanding or whatever. Now, this is how Paulo began. In the 1950s, he did not begin in, a, uh, in an institutional or formal education setting. He began doing adult education uh, for illiterate peasants and farmers. And uh, that's a very different uh, situation than moving than he, he ended his career with uh, being the chancellor of the Sao Paulo schools, where he had to move into a very already a very articulated institution with uh, all the things I mentioned before that uh, are what Paulo called the limit situations that it work, work against. Uh, so, I, so I propose the first look people that, all right, here we are, we're, our job in critical pedagogy is to question the status quo. That's, that's what the general orientation that brings us together. Okay, now we can question male supremacy, 
We can uh, question white supremacy. We can question imperialism and colonialism. We can uh, um, uh, question uh, color caste, where the lighter skinned you are in any ethnicity, the more you can pass and, and draw upon privileges and so on. So there's what, while those are second level, what stands above it all that unites us is that we're all questioning the status quo. And we're questioning it in the name of social justice. Now, that phrase appears so often, and I've said it so often, and I'm not sure that uh, the people I address know what I mean. That I, because it's so familiar and comfortable for me, I, I have to know question whether I'm, I'm communicating. So I've decided to say that when I, and then say afterward immediately, okay, well, I want to question the status quo. And I want to question in the name of social justice. And then by social justice, I mean four things that count the most in my practice, which is democracy, equality, ecology, and peace. Those are the four orientations that as I do go downward from what um, philosophers call levels of generalization, that the highest level of generalization we call critical pedagogy. The next level we say it's questioning the status quo. Now, all these are continued to be abstractions. So eventually, as I go down the levels of generalization, I have to reach concrete practice in the classroom Monday morning. You see what's going on? But I have to start at the highest level so that all of us coming from all these countries are speaking from, and we're speaking from a, uh, as feminist partisans against um, uh, male supremacy and as uh, folks who oppose white supremacy, we have to begin to identify and appreciate what, what brings us together. As the, as the highest levels of extraction, and then keep going down to observe each of our practices when we go to work, and we take a mass practice to, to this ugly society, all the ugly societies that we live in, all the oligarchies. But that mass practice at the very bottom where the rubber hits the road, it comes down from something higher up where we say, a more beautiful world is possible. And we all want it. And, that, and so we're doing critical pedagogy to question the status quo because it's ugly and cruel and uh, unfair and, and unequal and so on. And then we're gonna do this and this. So we do, I say democracy, equality, ecology, and peace. And those four orientations enable me to uh, combat racism, <clears throat> sexism, corporate hegemony, homophobia, and so on. Because these are all the divisions that create uh, inequality and uh, uh, no democratic rights as you, for a certain, for very large groups that are subordinated. Okay, Pyra, can we conclude, peace. please? What's that? Can we conclude, please? please? Yes, let's conclude. So equality and peace need something, need um, no, uh, no um, ex, ex, explanation. All right, now, so um, let me move down to the last concluding remark. Thank you very much. Okay, so, that when we reach the uh, when we reach the bottom where we're going to practice, there are two foundational questions of educators, and those foundational questions are, where does subject matter come from, and the second one is, what do we do with it? So in the in those two questions, we have an enormous enormous categories of schooling contained. That is, what are we teaching about? What are the contents and subject matters? And so if we, we have to now understand, we're teaching this subject matter because we have chosen these contents because, and we cannot just announce them. We have to now finish the sentence because to justify and understand and be metacognitive on ourselves about why, why are we dealing with these, why these contents? The second thing is if we, we get through that discussion, we then have to say, well, what do we do with this subject matter which we're trying to teach? And now we're dealing with the learning learning process. That's where the rubber hits the road when we get down to the, uh, to the practice. So in that, I've developed a, uh, a bunch, I need now tools to take to the classroom where every time I use a tool, I am not reproducing inequality hierarchy and the teacher-student contradiction. And because I only have 15 minutes today, I have all the tools sitting right here, but there is absolutely no time for me to demonstrate the tools and explain to you what I hope they accomplish. Thank you very much. I'm very grateful that you would listen to me for this long. Thank you. Thank you, Ira. Um, of course, I, we can take a couple of questions here, statements or reflections before uh, we move on to the uh, fourth speaker. 
Any comments, any reflections, any statements, any questions? Just, just a clarification, Karen. Sure. Um, Ira uh, um, made reference to a remark I made yesterday about yeah. the style. Um, I do not, I do not overlook the struggle within language. You know, I mean, there is merit also in uh, some of the writing, which gets erroneously, in my view, and stupidly also dismissed as being too difficult. What that often means, crass and slovenly thinking on the part of the reader, because language is also a struggle. And the point you just made confirmed that you were, you know, like tentative and groping. Well, that's what great writers do, in at least in theory, etc. I, I mean, in social theory, I'm not going to talk about novelists, etc. Is that the language of struggle? Now, I know I'm not the only one who's saying this. Henry Giroux does this a lot, says this a lot. And we've discussed this via email. Sometimes there is that struggle. But then eventually, um, I notice you, Henry, Henry in particular, I notice this a lot. The language <coughs> gets, gets more, how should I put it, incisive? Incisive, that for sure. Incisive. Yes. But with greater clarity. It's always a process of becoming, you know, uh, you become, you feel less insecure, less contradictory, as Paolo would put it, but it becomes like that. I think Henry's writing, for example, compared to the erudite, erudite I don't know how you pronounce that, um, theory and resistance, which for many people seems to be the only book they've read by him, if they have read it, okay? And they keep judging him today by that book. Um, you look at his later work, his entire earth, there is an apart ev evolution of ideas, which what every good writer is, has, you also have the, the changes in the language. And I, I feel they become more authoritative, authoritative, not authoritarian, of course, authoritative in the in Paolo's sense. But at the same time, one appreciates where you started the language of struggle, language born in struggle. So some, some people confuse that. Okay, so, I mean, that's the point. I just wanted to clarify that. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Any other comments, please? There's Donaldo, there's Chris. Start with Donaldo. Yeah, I, I, I've always, you know, what Ira mentioned, that's a constant in teacher preparation because any classroom, particularly in asymmetric way, power asymmetrically distributed along the lines of race, class, and gender, Boston Public School, for example, you know, you, the space that we have, you know, uh, is not really a welcome space, it's a space of conflict. So conflict resolution will be part and parcel of how do we basically, you know, transcend, you know, uh, something that could lead to cynicism you know, they're saying, you know, good teacher in three years, they leave. Or we begin to understand, I think one of the fundamental things that Paolo, uh, uh, you know, at least share with, 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 with uh, his readers and those who wanted to listen and read him, is that there's always a violence that precedes, you know, the classroom context. We need to understand why the conflict, where the conflict comes from, what conflict against what, for whom, and against whom, you see? Knowing that, you know, quote unquote, we are a bit more learned, and then we have to do a lot of listening, you know, before we come up with tools. And I think like he was able to do that, you know, with adult learners, and I'm not equating adult learners with the, uh, uh, with, with youngsters, uh, that what became more important is a development of political clarity because students who are often particularly you know minoritized student because you're not allowed to say subjugated student without being labeled a Marxist minoritized student uh, minoritized student uh, uh, we need to understand uh, why they are angry why they are you know dismissing what we have to say what is the relationship with their reality, with the content that we offer. For example, 
uh, I re correctly said that somebody out there corrects the curriculum. Well, we need to begin to, to interrogate why does somebody else out there corrects the, you know, collects, you know, you know, presents the curriculum as a package that needs to be to be uh, to be uh, implemented by teachers who become function functionary and and unknowingly and and blindly and unquestionably just you know follow the rules and the regulation because they have to do a test then the standardized testing and all these other issues complicate our lives then to do career pedagogy becomes enormously difficult now because it is enormously difficult we cannot give up we cannot give hope you know but i'm not talking a hope of uh, of um on my church, for example, yeah, it's not as good here, but another when you go to heaven, it's going to be beautiful. No, I'm talking about creating a heaven, you know, that I can share with my students, with everybody that I come in contact with. So I have to then deal with the a priori, thus for me, before tools, political clarity, and I think Henry Giroux learned that lesson throughout the years, political clarity is what leads you know, to writing clarity. So if we as teachers remain politically confused in our theoretical theater, then it's very hard for us to write Excellent. a language that basically has the clarity that like Paulo used to do using Bunites as people word, you not know, to sort of engage them in, in more complex issues that to the realization that in fact, they are not dumb, savage, and otherwise, that in fact, it was the upper class, mm -hmm. the dominant class, through their teaching, that continually, you know, send message that they are dumb, savage, and not worthy of teaching. Yeah. Um, Donaldo, Ira, this is a question for you, perhaps. Donaldo uh, mentioned the term uh, listening. Now, we all know how you know, um, universities in the neoliberal world are being organized. I call them small bite, you know, study units. How, units, how can we subvert that organization to create, you know, the space for listening and profound? Okay, <laughs> it's mm -hmm. very difficult, you know, let me give you an example. My students is, you know, always what, what I raise is something that we all confront, you know, by and large, more or less, you know, uh, they say, how am I going to do this? You know, the kids are doing this, you know, kids that witness a killing the night before, you know, a young child that got molested by an uncle, so on and so forth. The, all of these are incredibly complex issues that to pretend that we have answers, you know, would be, would be irresponsible. But then I say, if you're a critical, critical teacher, the ability to, tremendous ability to listen, and then Together with your students, you create, you know, conditions that questioning can lead to an understanding about why they are alienation, they suffering, and so on and so forth. Together, you can bring, by the development of trust, a classroom that's more manageable. But I say, think about it. You have done all this work. You've re you've read all of these folks who are in no question committed to imagine a world that less vicious and more harmonious. And then let's say you quit. What will be the alternative to these for these kids? The alternative would be somebody who is insensitive, you know, somebody who couldn't give, you know, a damn about what happens to these kids. Or like I have heard before, you know, Juanito ain't gonna make it before fourth grade, you know? I mean, that already is center certainty that I as a teacher or that teacher as a teacher has decided that Juanito will not for whatever reason, because the measures being used as precisely can he spell, can she, uh, can she uh, 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 <coughs> deal with the punct punct punctuation so on and so forth, or can she basically, you know, uh, adhere to the composition way of writing an introduction a middle and an end, you know, I don't think this way, at least, I don't begin with introduction. The introduction is the last thing I write of all the books I have written, you see what I'm saying? But yet we, you know, we have theories of composition that do that. Well, it is a, it is really chaotic. It is uh, uh, um, 
not you know the most loving place, but classroom represent not the only space, but a hopeful space that we can matter. To me, when I get a letter, you know, 10 years later, 20 years later, for somebody who says, thank you, Donaldo, you know, I never thought that I was going to make, but I am a medical doctor, you know. Uh, even if I save that one student, regardless mm. of the tool that I use, Brilliant. I feel rewarded. But withdrawing through cynicism, cynicism and fatalism because City Hall is too hard to fight, then City Hall wins, you know, by my adoption of fatalism and cynicism. Great, Donald. Okay. Chris, um, I know you had a, uh, a reflection, but we're running really out of time. Hassan. On uh, to the uh, fourth speaker under the uh, Aegis umbrella of this uh, particular you know, uh, session. And the fourth speaker is uh, Hassan Aksoy, based at the University of Ankara. Um, I've read some of his uh, works and I readily identify um, myself with his agenda, which is basically a critique neoliberal education reforms uh, in Turkey, privatization of education, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, uh, Hassan Aksoy will be speaking about, you know, uh, boosting uh, teachers' pedagogical competence through Freudian concepts in desperate times. Hassan. Are you with us, Hassan? Yeah, I am here. Uh, Bye. That's, uh, that's for me hello to, speak, to all. Isn't it? Yeah. Uh, oh, well, I don't know. Yeah. My, all right, maybe you're right. My network, Hold on, let's put you uh, on mute again. Involved. There's something wrong there, actually, Ian. Uh, we are someone else together uh, talking. Yeah, uh, it's okay for me. Uh, I yeah. don't know uh, where to start. Where to start? Uh, uh, a lot of, of things uh, to say. One of the part, starting from back, because uh, this defines today. Uh, here we are, where we came from. Uh, I am uh, recalling. Then that's that makes that makes uh, my thinking uh, uh, together uh, the past and the future. I won't uh, finish my speech. I will only uh, stop or cut at any place, the time uh, will not allow us at the end. Uh, this is, you know, already Freire also says that unfinished education. So if you expect me to finish some things very clearly and uh, solve all aspects of an issue, uh, you will not be able to get it. I'm sorry. Uh, but I think uh, we can make uh, a couple things clear uh, about uh, my perspective on the uh, history city of Turkey regarding education, educational, uh, in education setting. But I am uh, going to talk mostly uh, some uh, a place a history uh, I joined directly so there are a lot of uh, my observation I went to school I went to high school uh, in the period of military regime uh, in 1980 Hope data uh, realized, and the Turkish uh, teachers, students, citizens' life 
drastically changed. Reality became uh, normal, uh, legal, or uh, a daily part of the life uh, in that time. Like in Chile uh, in 1973. Uh, you know why it happens? My, my focus uh, first uh, goes to 1980s, the roots of the neoliberal policies in Turkey. I'm not going to read uh, directly because I know that I can't finish uh, on uh, a proper time this, but I will try to make it basic and uh, abstract. Uh, military regime first focused on uh, critical peoples, actually opposite peoples, militant uh, uh, in, Bra in Brazil, uh, people being terrorized uh, became uh, unlawful, depending on definition of the military regime. Teachers uh, imprisoned, students uh, oppressed, no one could say against the uh, rules of uh, new regime. So just before then that time, maybe a few months ago, people of uh, Turkey, youth, was uh, talking about revolution. A lot of concepts was very well known uh, by the uh, educators, youth, even high school students. Uh, I remember that time. That time, uh, I for, uh, find some books. What we what we read at high school time. I took a, a couple. Lettera a una profes, professoressa. Uh, my friends here uh, in uh, in the screen remember Don Lorenzo Milani's uh, book, but uh, not named as a book uh, author as Lorenzo Milani's that time. I didn't figure it out that that book uh, was from uh, Lorenzo Milani. Also, uh, Catherine Baker, No to Obligatory Education, Ivan Illich, The Schooling Society. Any other uh, popular people, uh, you will, you will uh, know them. A lot of Russian uh, socialist edu educators like Kalinin, Vasily Shumlonsky, Shumlinsky, Antonio Makarenko. This, this uh, authors is uh, well known uh, our educate, ed educators and some others uh, people mostly read by uh, left wing youth, uh, were Marx, Engels, Lenin, Mao, Enver Hoxha, all uh, left wing leaders, socialist, communist uh, leaders uh, with, with their books were being read and the discussion happening in, uh, in schools, in organizations, a lot, a lot uh, deeply, deeply with the mottos, a lot of motto around. Let me say what I'm uh, going to uh, say is about that. There was some uh, aphorismas, a lot of aphorismas we were learning. One of them is very well known by any, any Turkish young is superstructure or substructure. Super, uh, sub, substructures defines the superstructures. Almost every uh, Turkish students could say this uh, as a as a uh, 
Afor, aforizma e, by Marx. Or if you think that uh, eleventy thesis, we can memorize it. It's it's easy. Everyone knows that. Uh, it doesn't matter what the exact uh, meaning of uh, this uh, this this words. It becomes a, a emotion in the, in the country. It, it, it's important. I am not saying that this is not important. It is, uh, it is uh, energy. It is uh, a kind of uh, wisdom uh, connected with the body. You feel yourself revolutionary. You, you know that you are with uh, a lot of, with a lot of people. Uh, at other part of the world, in China, in Russia, in Algeria, in Vietnam, this this is this is very uh, important knowledge. Maybe uh, I will say ag again a basic uh, motto uh, words: What is the economic and social structure of the Turkey? We were discussing this issue uh, when I was. Uh, in high school, actually, actually started at middle school, but uh, I just uh, rem remember became solid uh, in high school time. Uh, these words, philosophers have hitherto only interpreted the world in different ways, but the point is to change it. Uh, Everyone knows that this is the this is the uh, Leon's thesis by Marx uh, in Feuerbach, uh, the end of the uh, classic German philosophy. Uh, but why I am letting you know this? This is this is uh, a, a climate uh, a climate of uh, Turkey in 19th, uh, 1980s, just before the, the military regime, Kopteta, fascist uh, junta came to power and the people destroyed many uh, teachers, uh, fired a lot of uh, people, uh, imprisoned some of them. Uh, took capital uh, punishment, unfortunately, and the uh, torture was almost legal. In these uh, conditions, there was a lot strong consciousness uh, regarding uh, capitalism as anti-capitalism. Uh, this, this. What uh, made uh, how kind uh, convulsions happens happen, uh, intervention of uh, military regime against the society uh, in a knowledge uh, in a consciousness regarding the uh, oppression. Uh, after the first years of. 1980s, uh, Junta uh, oppressed, tried to uh, try try to put into neoliberal policies directly, but very slowly, very very slowly. Not change everything uh, at uh, at every le every level. Because people accept that education is a right for public. Education is right, we know. Working is a right. So people uh, graduated, change their mind uh, un until the Hitato, uh, I mean, neoliberal policies, uh, it works slowly. And neoliberalism became 
visible in education through privatization, through another, another uh, practices in public schools, uh, different employment practice of teachers. A lot of science you can see, you can uh, go ahead to work for years because time change. We are, uh, we are not in solidarity. Uh, instead, you should race with your friends uh, as teachers. But uh, the problem, I am going to uh, say that in this uh, period after uh, 1990s, uh, neoliberal policies uh, take uh, take speed, and uh, a lot of educational reforms uh, put into work. As one of the educators, I couldn't label them. I read a lot of uh, very critical, radical. Marxist uh, papers or something, I know that how to struggle directly, uh, but I don't label them uh, as a part of Washington uh, consensus, as a part of uh, any, any other uh, world institutions come together and define this uh, as neoliberal policies put into Actually, we, we know uh, a lot of things uh, happening uh, and wrong against the uh, people, against the people, but it, they are all different things. We did not connect them. Uh, that, that, uh, that time, uh, the cri critical pedagogy is not uh, visible uh, in, Turkey, but I can say that a lot of revolutionary educators uh, know, uh, known, and the teachers are revolutionary. And also I can say that those people comes uh, from 19, uh, before uh, then 1980s, works in, in schools as educators, established the new unions uh, of Turkey at 1990s. So that uh, consciousness regarding to education of that group was mostly uh, in politics. In politics, what kind of politics related with the education is, sees, sees that education is something we are doing in schools, and the politics is something placed in other place. So we cannot mix uh, together. We are not taking them as a, a wholeness. Uh, so that's the that's the pro that's the problem. For me too, I understand that I was uh, in struggle at outside of the school. But in school, the subject matter is important. Subject matter is subject matter. No, uh, uh, no, you can connect that subject matter into the polit politics. And uh, uh, about 2000, we uh, met critical pedagogy authors, uh, mo mostly. A even uh, Paulo Freire, published or translated uh, into Turkish in 1991, but not well known by the educators. Uh, but after 2000, Egitim Sen, uh, at Left Wing Teachers Union, uh, translate the book of Michael Apple. And in that book, Paulo Freire mentioned about, uh, uh, talk about uh, 
Michael Apple. So there is there was a connection. Then I uh, went to I went to pedagogy uh, uh, of oppress oppress uh, and we started to see another critical educators uh, in the world. We had a uh, connection with them. It uh, became very uh, strong co connected. Uh, after we see the connection with neoliberal policies, economic uh, part of the life and the educational part of the life connected well through the labeling them as neoliberal policies and uh, also in education side education is uh, <clears throat> a political action and schools are a part of struggle that time also uh, some other uh, authors also help to make this uh, clear so uh, struggling in education or schools uh, by education not uh, different uh, things politics and education uh, it makes <clears throat> this uh, this become clear by uh, mostly uh, uh, teachers educators uh, university, university students, some uh, members of social movements, a lot of uh, groups join that that kind of understanding uh, by different critical educators or critical uh, theorists. Not only Paulo Freire in this uh, period uh, very powerful or uh, alone. In education side, uh, he became very popular uh, and uh, vis visible. I would like to uh, say that maybe uh, I will not have time to say this because uh, I mentioned that first some uh, some very short words became very popular, but there is no meaningful explanation and uh, putting the life that... Sorry, Hassan, uh, you have one minute left, okay? All right, that's it, three. Uh, okay, uh, dangers, uh, dangers for phrase ideas becoming meaningless words, uh, only becoming aphorisma. Because uh, I ask uh, some of uh, the uh, Ideas of Paulo Freire, I uh, I told uh, to them uh, about twelve uh, students. Uh, mostly, uh, they are higher uh, graduate <laughs> student or teacher uh, already. Very similar concepts uh, they are uh, focusing. Very very uh, uh, similar things, and they are they are becoming alone and the meaningless words, how they will put into work in their life. Yes, they are, uh, they are becoming work, uh, in, in, in work. Uh, Irene, Irene uh, Sennamo uh, asked yes, yesterday to uh, an, 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 an Hudson, Anne Hudson, how we will uh, work in, uh, put into work. Uh, Anne says very well, like my students uh, said, uh, very uh, very close things that you will change you will change syllabus in your class this is this is change of te teaching I took a lot of a lot of speech a lot in my classes without uh, without thinking uh, the curriculum uh, I'm talking about their life I'm caring for them like Don Lorenzo Milani I care uh, my students, I care uh, my people uh, at outside of the school. So uh, this is this is the uh, going into deep of the 
efforts uh, and the, uh, getting them collected uh, together. But we, we had a conclusion that you can't take Paulo Freire alone. You can't take, if you take him alone by uh, himself, you cannot understand the Paulo Freire. You need to uh, read Gramsci. You need to uh, take Marx together. Even uh, some of my students say that uh, about the subject, I couldn't understand from Paulo Freire, but I learned his words after I uh, read uh, Foucault about the subject. So this connection comes uh, together and uh, make a synergy. I'm going to say that we are uh, we are thankful uh, to Freire's concepts and uh, words make us uh, make us knowledgeable in our conditions how uh, can change them with an, a lot of other authors and th thinkers but we will not going him alone uh, in instead uh, we also will be get together uh, with alive people to make uh, better an educational all for all thank, thank you, you hassan much, thank you hassan thank you hassan it's very clear that living prayer uh, in turkey is basically living dangerously um and i have first hand experience of that uh, a few months you know after uh, the coup i was invited over to a conference i decided to change the uh, title of my uh, keynote presentation to the concept of uh, the rebellious uh, educator. It was a very surreal, you know, situation. People, it was full house. People were only connecting with me through their own eyes. And of course, there was no applause at the end, no uh, signs of, you know, affection or appreciation at the end. So I could sense, you know, uh, the danger and the, my naivety in coming to uh, uh, Turkey with such a title, the rebellious, you know, uh, educator. Um, <laughs> so uh, let's take a few questions before we conclude uh, this session. Questions or statements or reflections? Any questions or any statements or any reflections following uh, Hassan's presentation? Yes. Uh, Colin. You have to unmute, Colin. How's that? Can you hear That's me? That's perfect. Oh, thank yes. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you very much for, for Hassan's session. And I think the situation in Turkey and, and actually throughout the West and the North is very, very worrying. And the, the theme I want to raise is that what's common to all of these countries, including the country I live in, the country probably most, most of us live in, is the drive towards centralization. And it has four forms. It has the centralized bureaucracy, the centralized media, the dominance now of the big universities, and finally, the dominance of the so-called democratic big party system. And I think as well as talking about capitalism as the problem, we've got to talk about the development of huge institutions. Yeah. Okay. Great. Any other comments, please, or reflections or statements or questions before we uh, bring this session to an end? Let me add this for Turkey was uh, military, uh, domination. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, now a kind of ch exchange. Uh, some institutions, university does not uh, have a sense in uh, society very much now. Yeah, that's right. Okay, Hassan. So let's uh, call it an end. I should like once again to thank all the speakers, starting from Ali to Donaldo to uh, uh, Ira, and of course at the end. Um, uh, you know, uh, Hassan, uh, for the very insightful, you know, uh, presentations. So now it's over to uh, Peter to continue sharing uh, this uh, 
uh, event. Um, hello, thank you very much. Um, we're supposed to have a break. Do you want to have a break or shall we continue with the second and final session? Uh, so we can wrap up a bit earlier. Yeah. <clears throat> oh. I don't know. Let's move on, Pete. You think we should move on? Okay. Yeah. Oh, let's enter Peter? now. Yes. Yes? Peter? Yes? I, I, I need to, to make it no obligation. Uh, uh, your friendship. A what? And uh, your, uh, your support uh, on me. Uh, Regarding to Paulo Freire, uh, your book, Liberating Praxis, uh -huh. uh, you provided uh, me to uh, read and uh, translate uh, with uh, my wife. Uh, she's yeah, you and your and Naïs uh, translated that book into Turkish. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, yeah uh, 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 it it helped me uh, to. Uh, It helped me to understand uh, the, uh, uh, a lot of uh, authors also connected to Freire's idea uh, to see to mm. see them uh, and the all English uh, written books uh, on Paulo Freire uh, was in there uh, and we had a lot of uh, knowledge. Uh, it makes a, a good starting point for us also uh, along in turkey with, uh, with, uh, yeah but in, Tur in turkey and the uh, other other yeah. books thank you for translating it and other books um i mean i have to say that uh, hassan has also been translating not just uh, mine but uh, peter mclaren and others uh bringing crit you know um books in critical pedagogy but also turkey itself has produced a lot in critical pedagogy, and they have even a journal dedicated to critical pedagogy, and even suffered for their pains because um, um, our friend uh, Kemal Ilal, who is the editor of Elistere Pedagogy, I don't know how my, uh, if my pronunciation is correct, which means critical pedagogy, lost his job uh, as um, on the pretext of the the putsch. You know, the, the recent one the, the, there was a putsch in Germany in in Turkey. Um, which is ironic because it, it, um, um, Kemal is not, a, you know, I don't think he's a religious man. And uh, the, this putsch was originally blamed on Fatih Tulen, the Gulen of the Gulen movement, but Erdogan used this as an, as an excuse to, to, to purge um, universities and other institutions of liberals, radicals, Kemalists, etc. Okay, let's move on now. We're into already through Turkey and through an international perspective, as I hope the whole conference is. Okay, um, I would now we're going to enter enter the um, the team, which try to we we try to create teams to to find some commonalities between papers. Uh, of course, it turned out we have we had all women panels yesterday. We had all men panels today. We went by teams. It so happens we don't paint by numbers and anybody who joins today say this is an all male affair it is not in fact if you take the three days in total it, it's it it you know the, the was much diversified uh, yesterday in particular um it's reinventing fair in different contexts this is more like um it's more like an international comparative uh, education sort of and uh, the first speaker is uh, another person who has been um contributing towards Freire and critical pedagogy in India and in Bangladesh through his publications and publications in English, of course, uh, bringing together the worlds of Tagore, Gandhi, also Grunvig, because of the experience he had in, in, in Denmark, and of course, Paulo Freire. And this is uh, my good friend, Asoke Bacharya. I don't know if I pronounce it correctly, Bhattacharya. Um, from Yadavpur University and the Bangladesh Lifelong Learning Institute. Paulo Freire in the Indian context. Asoke, it's over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. And I'm honored that I have been invited to speak in this seminar, international seminar. 
So I will speak my, the, you know, heading of my lecture is Paulo Freire from an Indian perspective. Mm. We would like to reiterate at the very outset that Paulo Freire was the third world theorist on education in general and adult education in particular. <laughs> the question of basic literacy in the context of the electoral politics was one of, the, one of the central concerns for Freire in his crusade for the empowerment of the poor in Brazil. His work among the poorest of the poor led him to discover some of the most glaring anomalies that existed in the life and work of the poor and illiterate people of Brazil. All these fundamental discoveries were made working with these people intensely. In this paper, we shall investigate some of the fundamental discoveries of Freire, which emanated from his work in Brazil. Number one, his discovery regarding achieving literacy in 30 hours. This is an epoch-making discovery of Paulo Freire. Previously, the illiterate adult had to go through the same process of alphabetization as that of the child. This undermined the adult illiterate self-respect this method of making an illiterate person literate brought forth ridicule, both from the adults and the children. Paulo understood well the plight of the adult illiterate, desiring to be literate, but he also felt that she or he should not be subjected to humiliation in the process of having literacy. Paulo emphasized that an adult illiterate only lacked alphabetization, though he and she was quite knowledgeable about the ways of the world. Their survival in a hostile world was a proof of their alacrity and knowledge. They needed to be provided only that much input that would make them literate. Therefore, he conceived of the gener generating words and themes that governed her universe. The generating themes were those which constituted her existential reality. And the generating generative words were those which were known to her or him through her or his use of daily vocabulary. So he started with favela, the place where most of them lived in urban Brazil, and with the view, with a few other words in which she or he was familiar, the selection of words was made with the following criteria, phonemic richness and phonetic difficulty. Number two, he reversed the process of alphabetization for the adults. He started with a generating theme. That theme was then broken down into words. The words then were split into alphabets. That is exactly the reverse process in which a child gets a literacy. And here was apparent his philosophical approach from known to unknown. The theme was known, say, I live in a favela. The illiterate person lives in the favela. It's a reality which she's aware of through her everyday existence. Only she does not know how to read and write the words or pronounce the sentence from the written words, which graphically represented the sound. Now, the sentence is broken down. I live in a favela. She is now becoming conversant with I. She learns one alphabet. And of course, about herself, I. She learns one alphabet. And then next word is leave. It is broken down into L, I, V, E. Now she learns L. So I is already known. And now she learns V, its shape and the pronunciation. And then E, then comes the word in. As she breaks it down into I and N, she finds that I is known to her. She learns a new alphabet, N. And then A is now being learned by her. The next word is favela. F she learns, A she has already learned, V she has learned previously, E she has already learned, L is known to her and R has been learned already. Thus, in the course of two hours, she has learned the following alphabets, I, L, V, E, N, A, F. Now the person can form more words out of those already learned in a method of permutation and combination. This method is eminently suitable for an adult learner. It preserves her independence, does not belittle her in the eyes of the public. Mm -hmm. And by being able to form new words out of her own vocabulary, vocabulary, vocabulary universe, she's elevated to the rank of a crossword puzzle solver.
Number three, Paulo Freire says, we begin with the conviction that the role of human beings has not only to be in the world, but to engage in relations with the world, that through the acts of creation and recreation, humans make a cultural reality and thereby adds to the natural world, which she did not make. We were certain that humans' relation to reality expressed as a subject to an object results in knowledge, which humans could express through language. From that point of depart departure, the illiterate would begin to affect a change in his or her former, former attitudes by discovering himself or herself to be a maker of the world of culture, by discovering that he or she, as well as the literate person, has a creative and recreative impulse. He or she would discover that culture is just as much a clay doll made by artists who are his or her peers, as it is the work of a great sculptor, a great painter, a great mystic, a great philosopher, that culture is a poetry of lettered poets and also the poetry of his or her own popular songs, that culture is all human creation. By one master stroke, Freire elevated the scavenger to the level of a professor. For the reality of India, it is very significant discovery. Indian society had long been divided into castes and subcastes, and even educated persons are not free from this notion of caste, just as the educated person in the West are prejudiced about race. The kind of atrocities that continues even today in the villages and towns of India against the Dalits is to be seen to be believed. But who is a more important cultural worker than a sweeper who cleans the physical world, physical space? Can a university, the highest seat of learning, function if these people cease to perform their work for a single day? Paulo's thesis that a cultural worker changes the reality of the natural world into a cultural world is revolutionary to say the least. This has the potential to make the so-called elites see them as much as cultural workers as the sweeper or the scavenger. The latter be much more important since without her participation, the elite cultural worker cannot create and even exist. I believe that Brazil being a country similar to India socioeconomically and culturally, a former colony with all the attributes of a dependent society, encouraged Freire to advance this thesis. The class divided and racially divided society of Brazil being his springboard to promote his, this concept, it has become quite relevant to a country like India having the same division in the society and in many cases even worse than that in its treatment of the Dalits whose touch or even the touch of a shadow would make the higher caste impure. Had this philosophical tool been known to Gandhi, I feel he could have achieved much further progress in his fight against casteism. He fought the evil practice of untouchability from the context of humanization, but he could fight it, fight it more resolutely from one point of view of, from the point of view of culture, which was considered as a prerogative of the higher castes. And now the culture of silence. It is not always easy for the illiterate to look at the world in the way it is proposed by the elites, predecessors. And he writes, self-depreciation is another characteristic of the oppressed, which derives from their internalization of the opinion the oppressors hold of them. So often do they hear that they are, not, they are good for nothing, know nothing, and are incapable of learning anything, that they're sick, lazy, and unproductive that in the end, they become convinced of their own unfitness. In this connection, I would like to relate a story. We on behalf of Jalop University had adopted a rural area called Champahati in the South 24 Pragana's villages for the implementation of total literacy campaign. Prior to starting the program, we had organized a training session of the supervisors and educators in the village itself. Around 30 educators, and three supervisors assembled for the workshop. Our trainer called Kalyan Satpati, who was formerly a firebrand student leader of the highest caliber, had shifted from student politics into training of adult literacy workers under the guidance of legendary Satyan Maitra, the then director of Bengal Social Service League and the State Resource Center of West Bengal. It was the final day of the seven day training program. He had chosen a couple of peasants for his instruction 
who sat one corner of the uh, of the large hall after he explained the concept of the culture of silence he called one of the peasants he asked him few questions and then negated what the man proposed to our utter surprise we found that what paulo freire had said about the culture of silence was coming true in our experience he then called the other person and repeated the process we could see that freire's concept of culture of silence was not a figment of imagination it was a reality in that hall there were two persons who were in embodiment of culture of silence this phenomena can be observed in all the countries of the third world Paulo saw these people among the urban and rural poor of Brazil. We came face to face with them in villages of India. The notion was further elaborated by Freire. In the culture of silence, the masses are mute. That is, they are prohibited from creatively taking part in the transformation of their society and therefore prohibited from being. It is imperative to break the silence, thundered Freire. As already mentioned, this is the third world phenomena primarily. Thank you very much. Um, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you very much, um, Asoke, for your insights on Paulo Freire and his relevance to India. I think um, I, I'm going to revert to the older, the yesterday system and the day before. We'll confine questions to the very end to all the speakers. We ha we'll have enough time for that. And now I, um, um, of course, one of the issues which will be raised here and that is partly answered by Asoke, but I know you can never have definite answers to certain questions, concerns the caste system. Uh, what does, you know, how relevant is Paulo Freire? to the caste system. Um, um, another observation I'd like to make is that when it came to, comes to Brazil, there was a time, uh, I, I, maybe this has changed, uh, I, I'm quoting Frey Beto on this, when Brazil, to, to show the dichotomy between the population, it was known as, it was referred to by a famous economist in, in Brazil, Joel Betting, um, as Bel India, you will have a 30%, which is a large, in terms of numbers, it's quite a, quite, quite a consumption segment, even though it's a minority percentage-wise in Brazil, which has the standard of living of Belgium, and uh, the rest, the level of India. So, uh, the reaction between India, uh, the, the connection between India and Belgium was also posed by Brazilian economists in the past. This was in the 70s. I don't know if it still is the situation today. Um, we will now move from, uh, from India to another part of the world, which is the Northern Hemisphere, the, no, the no, Northern Europe, and uh, it is my pleasure to, to, to introduce uh, to you um, uh, my friend Juha Suranta from Finland, from the uh, University of Tampere. He will correct the statement how to place it, uh, University of Tampere. And he's going to talk um, Northern Reflections on Paulo Freire. Um, let me check the, yeah. Is there a Nordic Freire? the reception of Freire in Finland from 1970 to the present. Now, the, there is method in the madness, as Hamlet would say. Sorry, as, a, as Apollonius would say in Hamlet. There is method in the madness. I placed um, Juha exactly after Asoke. Why? Because as I told you, Asoke was also very much a Quran with the Nordic model of Grundvig in Denmark, and has written books on Grundvig, Tagore, and Freire, and Gandhi. So uh, it's interesting now to see a Nordic perspective coming from somebody from the Nordic countries, from Finland, who is a well-known, well-known in critical pedagogy circles, I have to say, uh, also um, Juha. So Juha, over to you. Is there a Northern Freire? Yeah, that's a question. That's a good question indeed. There is and there isn't. <laughs> but uh, thank you, Peter, for, for this kind invitation to be part of 
part of this this fest. Uh, I'm really honored to be with you all, comrades from all over the world. I would say that my presentation, it takes about 10 minutes or so. It will be the coolest because we have minus 18 degrees Celsius at the moment. And that is, that is one minus one Fahrenheit. So you can imagine that it's a coolest presentation <laughs> there is. <laughs> so it's free for all climates. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's all corners of the world. Also here, but you know, now Freire did have live, had to live in northern climates or central European climates too, as opposed to the southern climates of Brazil. That's true, and uh, he also visited Stockholm in Sweden, but yes. never Finland. Okay, well, let me start by saying something very briefly about the Finnish adult education philosophy. Uh, as you as you might know, like other Nordic countries. Finland has a strong historical tradition of non-formal, popular and folk education, which originated with several social movements in the second half of the 19th century, such as the women's movement, workers' movement, youth association movement, and the pro-independence phenomenon movement. The, these major traditions of Finnish uh, adult education or non-formal folk education, if you like, have underscored the social and equal nature of emancipatory adult education, which nurtures the capacities that every person needs to pursue a good life and participate as a citizen in creating a good society for everyone. This egalitarian character of Finnish adult education was partly inherited from the Nordic forerunners in adult education, notably uh, the Danish educational and political thinker Nikolai Grundvig, as Peter mentioned and Asoke very well knows, whose influence was crucial in all the Nordic countries, including Finland. And uh, these ideals are, uh, are heavily related to Freire's radical, radically humanistic view of liberating education as a process of humanization. Well, due to these Nordic ideals and the socialist labor movement's impact on workers' educational initiatives in the early 20th century, the Finnish adult education has been characterized by grassroots and bottom-up qualities. Following uh, the humanistic ideals, often in influenced by Christian and Marxist sources, uh, the Finnish tradition of emancipatory and critical adult education has developed important tenets that pay respect to people's integrity and life worlds. First, Adult persons' self-determination are valued as the essential starting point of all educational interventions. Second, attention to and appreciation of the unique local and communal social situations and contexts is central in Finnish adult education to strengthen people's modes of association and interaction instead of extraneous action models. By the way, I just uh, I just linked a couple of my, my recent uh, articles uh, of these matters I'm just talking about, and also Paulo Freire Center link. So please consult those two articles if you are interested in these, these topics. And uh, uh, the Finnish model also supports for social and political participation, which is understood to be an indispensable element of adult education here in Finland. People's well being cannot be disconnected from their political being, meaning that social justice and solidarity are essential for a good life. Well, what then has been Ferris influence? on Finnish educational sciences and practices from the 70s to this day. This story is quite short, actually. If we look at the past 50 years, Freire's ideas have, haven't been foreign to Finnish educators, although not, not maybe visible in mainstream 
educational policies and practices, Freire's ideas have been present as an undercurrent in the critical strands of pedagogy. In the 70s, these ideas were transmitted via contacts with radical Swedish educators. Sweden is next to, to Finland. Uh, so we have, uh, we, we have a common border. Those Swedish educators inspired Finnish participants in many cooperative ventures. Finnish educators' initial interest in Freire was related to the vibrant social activism of the late 60s and early 70s, underscoring the notion of parallel, parallel developments of critical education in different parts of the world. As a side note, it is perhaps worth to know and mention that the first Finnish language publication actually mentioning Paulo Freire was the translation of the Brazilian journalist Marcio Moreira Alves and his Un Grano de Mostaz, uh, in English, a grain of mustard seed in 1972. After the initial context with Sweden, Freire's works continued to inspire education theory and practice in Finland in the 70s and even in the 80s. For, for instance, in peace education, social pedagogy, and so forth. However, the political activism of the 70s, which uh, sort of laid the groundwork for the original interest in Freire, that faded away during the 80s because of the unlimited rule of the finance capital and the politics which followed. Therefore, and due to the shifts in academic and practical preference in adult education here, no lasting tradition of Freirean research and pedagogy emerged at the time, that is in the 80s and in the 90s. So we need to turn to the new millennium to find the birth, birth of a proper academic research on and broader practical dissemination of Freire's views. The signposts of this new phase for the past 20 years were the first in-depth, actually PhD dissertation on Freire in 2000 and the translation of the pedagogy of the oppressed into Finnish in 2005. So it's only 16 years ago. During the first two decades of the 21st century, these publications were accompanied and followed by many other studies, seminars, and activities partly organized by the Paulo Freire Center here in Finland. So different strands of critical pedagogy started to receive more attention overall uh, in, the, in the last uh, two decades. Uh, these, uh, this focused, more focused attention on Freire's thinking within educational and pedagogical research has coincided with and partly resulted from the increased interest in critical pedagogy in its Anglo-American forms. In this sense, in this sense, one could say that Freire like so many other influences in modern day academia, finally arrived in Finland via the US. Actually, we are actually mostly we are Peter McLaren's work because Peter visited Finland uh, quite many times in, 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 in the last 20 years. Even so, Freire's influence has been felt more in the fringe areas of education than in the mainstream. Typical examples include educational experiments in participatory action research and social pedagogy among socially excluded and ex exploited groups. By and large, Freire's thinking has received more attention in non-formal adult education, for instance, in workers' unions and lefty study centers than in the formal education system. Over the years, Freire's views have become widely diffused and intermixed with other educational philosophies and traditions in Finland. However, despite the prevalence of his ideas, 
it cannot be said that there is a particular Freirean paradigm in the Finnish education theory and practice. Instead, there are many Freire inspired approaches in the fields of education, social policy, youth work, and arts. And lastly, because of the neoliberal educational policies of the past decades, there seems to be now only a narrow space for Freire and thoughts in the educational sector in Finland. The spirit of the time is not on Freire's side, so to speak. Even, I mean, in Finland, he will probably live on the fringes of the Finnish educational scene in the future. But, and, and on the other hand, actors in the non-formal educational sector who apply, who still apply Freire, and find his ideas beautiful. They think that his thinking really benefits them in their struggle for the better world. So in sum, and I, I end here, Freire lives in the various adult education practices, non-formal sector of education along and within the Nordic educational tradition. Thank you. Thank you, um, um, Juha, um, <clears throat> um, to bring in uh, uh, the reception of Paolo Freire in Finland. I know you. I know there's a lot of interest in Freire's work. You can see this from some of the journals, which uh, for which you don't have to know Finnish because many of them, some of them are in English, in fact, and uh, very productive in this respect. Um, in adult education, you have lifelong learning in Europe, which is comes out of Finland. Lots of material on 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 Paulo Freire there, and of course the bringing together of the of Freire's work and the work of the Nordic concepts of education, including Runve, etc., which even uh, Asoke uh, wrote about, is is interesting in, by comparison. We now remain on a Nordic model but this time we move to scotland so there is again method in the madness and uh jerry uh, colin kirkwood something constructed with his wife his part um, jerry kirkwood who are well known in uh, many parts of the world because of their books on freire in scotland living adult education I know um, had a great impact among some of our adult education community education students in Malta. Uh, Edim, um, uh, Jerry Colin is connected with, the, with Edinburgh, University of Edinburgh, where there was once a very strong tradition about community education in Scotland, where we didn't hear discourse like, you have to move out of Edinburgh or Scotland into the world, the world-class university, because when we thought of community, Ireland and, and Scotland used to come, used to, used to be uh, very prominent in this respect. Um, and uh, Edinburgh University is famous for its programs in, in, in community education. I see May Show is connected here. Okay. Um, they're going to talk about a no Northern Reflections. Uh, Colin, over to you. Uh, you, ha you have to unmute. Let us hear you, Colin. I want to be heard. Thank you very much, Peter. We okay. are. You can you uh, have some music, right? We are. That's right. Now, what I'm going to do is make a brief presentation, lasting about nine or ten minutes, and then my friend Stan here, our colleague, our great Hi. Freudian practitioner, who is also uh, one of the founder, really, of the Scottish Traditional Music Group. He's going to play uh, on his machine down here, which we will show you later. And we're going to sing together uh, the Freedom Come All Ye, a great song. Freedom Come so, All Ye. I'm, okay. I'm going to start right now. <clears throat> the influence yeah. of Paulo Freire's thinking and writing arrived in Scotland in the mid to late 70s, a Scotland which already had its radical traditions, many of them. But these traditions often involved violent conflicts in which the theme of domination was invariably present and they go back a very long way. 
Indeed, it's possible to argue that in every part of the world and in every period of human history, a principal driver of human society and culture has been the will to power and the ensuing struggles for domination. And in that respect, Scotland and its neighbours, England and Wales and Ireland, are no different from the, the Arabian Peninsula, from Greece, Persia and Macedonia in ancient times, from Rome and Carthage, Africa, Europe as a whole, America, North and South, India, Russia, China. All of it is based and contains imperial urges, struggles for the domination of land, people, water and other natural resources. I'm not going to list them. That's the name of the game in this world. That's the real story of humanity. And if we don't manage to stop it soon, we will all be in really deep water. <clears throat> yeah. We've got a still shot right now. Now, in, in, in our own part, we in the form of protest men beating up women, conservatives versus organized labor, capitalism versus state socialism, whites versus people of color, and those owning resources versus those without resources. So the question is, how does all this link with Paulo Freire? I think it links in all sorts of ways because the story of domination, central though it has been to the human story, has never been the only story. There is also another far more important story. It's the story of nurture, of giving birth, of giving love, of feeding and clothing, attending and supporting. There has always been that story, this story, which I call the story of other orientation, need for the good other, love and praise of the good other, and sometimes sacrifice and loss of the good other. And there, were, there have always been human beings who, who embodied that other orientation in the practice of their lives, and most of them, not all of them, are women. I can think of at least three men, Jesus of Nazareth, Mahatma Gandhi, and Paulo Freire. And all of our lives have been deeply influenced by these people who embodied other orientation. <clears throat> I'm proud to have played a very modest part in trying to understand, teach and, and reinvent Paulo Freire's work in a Scottish context. And I praise the courage and canniness of Fraser Patrick, who's here with us today, uh, who persuaded uh, central and local government in Scotland <clears throat> uh, 40 years ago now uh, to adopt the ideas of Paulo Freire in establishing what we called the Adult Learning Project. I praise the courage and inventiveness of the great practitioners like Stan Reeves here, who is the longest working, the longest serving Freirean I think, apart from Freire himself. <laughs> okay. uh, also, Jerry, who unfortunately is in hospital now, Jerry Kirkwood, and Fiona McCall, our friend Fiona McCall, and then followed by Vernon Galloway, Nancy Somerville, and John Player. And I honour also the, the creativity and community of the, all the members of the Democratic Alp Association, which is still flourishing. Oh, and that's learning projects, right? Adult Learning Project. Thanks for that, uh, Peter. Yeah, yeah let's, let's avoid this kind of, uh, you know, acronyms because not everybody knows them. We thank, we thank Peter for publishing the second edition of the Living Adult Education, which I'm flashing about here. I don't know if you can Yeah, it. yeah it's a revised okay. version, yes. Okay, right. Now, so the, the question I think for today is where do we go with Paulo Freire now? Where do we go with Paulo Freire now? And I think we have come up against a number of brick walls. Paulo would have called them, as Donaldo was saying earlier, limit situations. And yeah. he would say that limit situations call for limit acts. So the first situation, an extremely worrying situation that Ashoki was really implicitly speaking about and 
and uh, the contribution from um, uh, Turkey was explicitly speaking about is this, that the human world, our world, stands on the brink of a return to violent authoritarianism, blatant domination, violent domination, highly manipulative, populist, and treating people as if they were pawns on a chessboard. The second limit situation, and this may be more controversial, but I think it's true, that we are close to reaching the limits of what has been called representative democracy. Now, I've consistently argued for a, most of my adult life that we don't have democracy at all, in fact. What we have is a form of elective dictatorship. And I think we need to take steps nationally and internationally uh, to integrate two things, good, strong, centralized leadership on the one hand and direct democracy, not representative democracy, but direct democracy on the other. That's the job, that's the challenge that we have to rise to. Now I'm gonna skip referring to the two books that I think are really excellent. The third limit situation, which is uh, <clears throat> more easily dealt with, is the unfortunate misrepresentation of the ideas and practices of Paulo Freire themselves. What's happened is that significant aspects of Paulo's thinking and practice have simply been omitted from some accounts of his work. <clears throat> the key omission has been the attempt to play down or exclude the religious dimensions of his contribution. And that's really shocking. And I'm glad to say it's ending and it has, uh, has ended to a large extent. Now, finally, for this my, my own speaking contribution, I want to offer a warning, which ties in with some of the things Donaldo started talking about, uh, a warning first and then a way forward. The warning is this, there is a danger of Paulo Freire's contribution getting lost in an academic cul-de-sac. Please can we not spend the next 50 years developing theoretical programs exploring how many Frarian angels can dance on the head of a dialogical pin. Okay, we have we've far too much of that kind of crap in many universities now. Paulo Freire, like Jesus of Nazareth, is a man of practice. I have a feeling God did not like that comment. <laughs> Colin, if you can hear me, you have to. Um... It's not a post doc. Okay. Of scale. And I want to have a foreground the following point. First, an end to the overemphasis on competition and success in education. For most people, you know, in the world, education is a hellhole because most of them are going to fail. The building in of failure to education means that education is not really education at all. That's the first point. Second one, an end to the overemphasis on information technology and education at every level. Now, I did say overemphasis. I'm not saying I'm against uh, information technology, but we need to revert to face-to-face -face interpersonal learning as much as we can. Third, I'm nearly at the end of this. We need to get just what you've done here, Peter. We need to get, get away from the exclusive emphasis on the national level and see more international resource sharing, more multiple use of languages. And then on the other hand, local, not national, but local self-organization. Local, yeah. Okay. I want to see the fourth point. I want to see us end the use of the clenched fist symbol. And I want to replace it with open hands reaching out across the world. Okay. I haven't said anything about this, but others have mentioned it. We have to save this planet for organic life. Now, I really will not go on to say any more about the idea of more international projects, but 
what I would like many inter international projects to do is to focus on becoming good models and demonstrating good models of Freirean practice throughout the world. That's what Alp tried to do. And I think Alp succeeded in doing that. And as Maria Nikolakaki argued yeah. yesterday, she added that it should be based on love, hope, and soul. And I endorse that. That's all I have to say. I hope we can <laughs> press on now to this music. Okay, so here's Stan. Sure. Come into the picture, Stan. Stan has got his squeeze got a squeeze box, his accordion, which Paolo and he agree is the instrument of popular education. <laughs> so here we go. So Stan. I'm Stan and just uh, want to say uh, that uh, Paolo and I had a conversation at a Cayley uh, in 1988 in Dundee about mm. the role of the accordion, which was a mass-produced instrument that spread across the world and is popular in most cultures. And he talked about the role of the accordion in, a, in music called For All, which was very popular in, in Northeast Brazil. And I think I remember us singing this song at this event all these years ago. <laughs> Is this I timed my hearing to perfection. To get <laughs> I'm just kidding. And of course, um, we will talk about this later. Interesting point you made about competition, which is the antithesis of a free in education, which brings to mind a famous Scotsman from Govan, who as chair, as uh, what's that, v v chancellor, v probably chancellor of the University of Glasgow told the graduates, don't join the rat race, because <laughs> the rat race is for rats, not for humans. Of course, I'm referring to the honorable Jimmy Reed. Jimmy Reed. 
whose books I can never find. I bought a book on the Red Clyde. I was in Scotland last, last week for two days only. We caught up with our students, so no, no chance to move, move out of my hotel, actually. It was freezing cold. Not as bad as London, though. And uh, I was looking for a book. On, I've been looking for biographies of Jimmy Reed. I ended up buying a book on the history of Occupy, which I use with my students in international relations. And I bought the book on the Red Clyde, the historical Red Clyde. But anyway, I'm talking stereotype here. From, from the instruments of Scotland and the bagpipe and whatever, to the br brass bands of the Caribbean. No, sorry, I'll take that back. It's a great pleasure for me personally. Because most of the people here I've met, but I've never met this person and I've been dying to meet him. Uh, we've met through emails and through, you know, publications, etc., but not to on the flesh. And this is a remarkable man. Think of yesterday's presentation by Anne Hickling Hudson from University, Queensland University of Technology, Brisbane, but originally from Jamaica. And uh, Didacus, you know, Paulo Freire was involved with the uh, literacy crusades. And it was Nicaragua in the, in the, in the 70s was big, eight, 70s, 80s, and Granada was another one. And of course, uh, of course, we had uh, Donaldo from Capo Verde, the literacy campaigns in, in, in the former African colonies of Portugal, which are now free. Um, um, Nomin nominally independent states. Um, we're going to talk about Freire in the Caribbean from Dr. Didikus Jules, a, a name you probably recognize in terms of revolutionary education. Brings back images of Morris Bishop, the new jewel movement. But I'm going to stop because he's going to talk about this stuff, not me. So, Didikus, welcome. And Great to meet you. Fine. Yeah, thank, you very, thank you very much. It's really a pleasure for me to see, at least to see facially colleagues like yourself, Robert Harry Hinton, who I met years ago from Germany, uh, Kamel Bog, and, and other colleagues. I was, it's just a pity my, my mentor, um, Michael Apple, is not <laughs> participating in this. Can you enable screen sharing for me, please? <clears throat> the, the screen sharing is disabled. It's on, it's on, it's on. Oh, okay, thank you. Nice background you have there. Yes, I decided to do something special. So yeah. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Are you seeing my screen? Yes, very yes. much so. Yes. Okay. Great. So on this centenary of Paolo, I would simply like to pay homage to him as a person of immeasurable humility, whose shared genius was to provide the philosophical and the methodological basis of an emancipatory pedagogy. Paolo was clothed with the, leg with the legacy of Socrates. He identified the pedagogical fallacy that had fundamentally altered the meaning and purpose of dominant models of education. Across the Western world, we've treated learners as empty vessels to be filled with knowledge by sages on the classroom stage. And in the best traditions of the greatest visionaries in education, from Socrates right through to Dewey, Paulo helped to restore to education its dialogic essence and make it a journey of mutual learning. A journey that shared, a journey that shared um, understanding and critical knowledge, and a journey that was transformative to the consciousness of those who embarked on it and made them more active authors of their own circumstance and destiny. The genius and the legacy of Paulo was in helping us as he put it, in reading the world to read the world and to be empowered to change the world. In this presentation, I want to tell 
the story of the application of this pedagogy as a methodology of emancipation. <laughs> the need for which so happily defined in our own Caribbean ballads of liberation, sung by Bob Marley, and I quote, emancipate yourselves from mental slavery. None but ourselves can free our minds. Have no fear of atomic energy, because none of them can stop the fight. I want to describe the genius of Paolo through the tale of two experiments in Yemen in the Eastern Caribbean that demonstrate his methodology of emancipation. Paolo visited the Eastern Caribbean twice, actually three times, twice to the year. The first in the early 70s, not in person, but through the emissary of his writing, and then in person in 1980 in revolutionary Grenada, twice as I said. The, the early 70s was a time of intellectual and political ferment in the Caribbean. Black pride and consciousness were a rising tsunami. Liberation theology was infusing a sense of duty to the emancipation of the spirit. Our schools of higher education were centers of critical inquiry. It was the moment for questioning everything. Unthink was the, was the mental mood. In St. Lucia, a young Black Roman Catholic priest, Patrick Anthony, fresh from the ferment of the Black Power movement that had energized a seminary from which he graduated in Trinidad, mobilized a group of mainly young Christians and established something called the Study and Action Group. As the name implied, its purpose was to study the works of radical thinkers and our society, and to act for social transformation. In 1973, following its reading of cultural action for freedom and pedagogy of the oppressed, the group was infused, influenced and infused to define its pro, in its program of action two initiatives that were consistent with what we learned from Ferry. One was a program of learning our culture by visiting rural communities. In those times, the rural communities were looked down upon, marginalized, despised. To discover, learn, document, and popularize our indigenous culture. That initiative subsequently became the Folk Research Center, which is still alive today that has sparked a national cultural renaissance. And the second was a literacy program in the prison, which I had the honor to lead to learn about what triggers a life of crime and how these lives could be transformed. In both initiatives, we were guided by six Ferian principles that were identified by Sanders 1970. One, the learner as a subject of his or her own destiny. Two, the importance of reflecting on one's own situationality. And one of our colleagues earlier today referred to this. Read your work. Three, higher self-awareness equals the capacity to change one's circumstance. Four, culture is created by critical interventions in one's milieu. Five, history is created by critical consciousness and action. And lastly, that education must ultimately provide the capacity to change one's world. The first major lesson that we experienced was the truth of the assertion by Paolo in cultural action for freedom, that to be an act of knowing, the adult literacy process demands among teachers and students a relationship of authentic dialogue. Establishing, sorry, establishing a relationship with our class of 14 inmates whose, whose ages range from 18 to 39 years with sentences spanning eight months to life for crimes involving shoplifting to murder was no easy task. The first step in the journey was an honest discussion of our why and our how in conducting the classes. Having invited honesty, we were tested by the most probing questions from them about our motives, our views of prisoners, our relationship with the authorities. Everything was subject to scrutiny. Why are you all, you know, petty bourgeois college boys coming to want to teach us to read and write? With the agreement of the prisoners, we started our mutual learning journey. The stark reality of their situation was their imprisonment. So jail 
as prison was more commonly referred to in St. Lucia at the time, was the dominant generative word. So we pose the question, what does jail mean to you? This initially elicited things like dictionary definitions that we rejected and we solicited gut responses. So people gave responses like, well, jail or prison is a place where those who are locked up, who commit crimes are locked up. We said, no, no, no. From deep within, what does jail feel and mean to you? The reactions were deeply profound. Recurring descriptions, descriptors referred to hell, hopelessness, despair, the inhumanity of being what we call in Sanusha, neglige, or literally a jail neglige, and only a solitary view that said that jail was heaven. Against angry objections, the protagonist who said that jail was heaven explained his reality. An honest man, he was originally sent to prison for stealing food to feed his starving family after a prolonged period of unemployment. His plea to the judge for alternative sentencing that would allow him to offer labor for restitution while being able to feed his family of five was unsuccessful. From the moment of his incarceration, he was abandoned by family and friends, stereotyped as a neglajol. On his release, he was homeless, friendless, jobless. So after a month of that condition, he decided that life was better in prison, so he stole again. His life henceforth, he told us, was going to be a permanent cycle of recidivism, a petty threat, because in prison, to quote him, he had a roof over his head, daily meals, and no worries in his head. From that first session, we identified a range of thematics, which provided the framework for an entire year of classes. These included not to not exhaustive, but crime and punishment, jail and suffering, jail and family, correction, rehabilitation, jail and freedom, and a prisoner's notion of time. Because crime and punishment obviously spoke to, there were very strong views on blue collar punishment and white collar privilege. How come the jail is only people from the lower classes? Where the, the, white, the white collar um, criminals who still, who collect individually still more than in value than the entire jail pop population, but are not in jail. Then jail and family, the impact of that on family. And then the prisoners, prisoners' notion of time was a curious dialectic. Time condemns you as they told us, and time releases you. Go figure that. The exploration of each theme solicited greater insight, critical insight by participants. And participants meaning us and inmates, because we were learning as much as the prisoners themselves going deeper and more analytical, analytically on each theme. Additionally, there were recurring cross-cutting topics or concerns related to family, the intersection of class and justice, impediments to rehabilitation, and the nature of justice in our society. So at the end of the first year of classes, we asked that everyone produce a drawing that symbolically captured what they considered to be the essence of our journey into prison and the prisoner. And the drawings that you see here are exact reproductions of what they produced. So this one, for example, um, spoke to the car. This one spoke to jail as a, you can see the massive walls of the jail, time being a very critical factor in the life of a prisoner and the escort into prison. So the thematic there was about time, incarceration, confinement, the role of the police. In this other drawing, the thematic is about suffering, incarceration, confinement, isolation, mental consequences. As, as they label it, jail, a place of suffering. And you can see from the, 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 the grotesque uh, character of the drawing, the size of the walls and the outside figure of the waters and so on, say something about the psychology of jail. The other drawing showed the security of the lockup. The thematic was time, as I said, jail is a place where you do a lot of daydreaming about the future and the past. So time, reflection, incarceration, confinement, past and future. 
And then this drawing speaks to the thematic of social exclusion. Notice that you have the three classes of fundamental classes of society, but the prisoners are outside of class. So they are subclass, a, 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 lumpen, a lumpen class. They recognize that you can even be in, in prison, you are at least below the lower class, but out of prison, you are even worse off than persons in prison for the reasons this guy who said prison was heaven um, explained. So it brought up issues on social exclusion, the role of class, the nature of justice, and social marginalization. A curious metaphor was the characterization of the game of cricket as a metaphor of the condition of prison. And that was strongly contested by all the other participants in the class. And that discussion extended over two class sessions because we felt, what are you saying here? That all we do in prison is play cricket in the yard, that it's a, a life of sport and, um, and, and relaxation. His explanation, the cricket umpire is the judge of the court. The fielders, the police were in place to keep you within your boundary. The bowler, notice the long arm with the ball. The bowler is the long arm of the law that swings the prisoner, the ball, towards the batsman, the prosecutor, who hits him with the bat, the instrument of the law. So it was an amazing revelation. The next week we came back with CLR James's book, Beyond the Boundary, that spoke about cricket um, as a metaphor of contestation against colonial hegemony. And we read extracts of CLR James to the class. And there was a moment of very introspective silence that still gives me goosebumps when I remember it. And the guy asked, who's this guy, CLR James? He said, he's a philosopher. Long silence, and he said, but he's saying the same thing I'm saying. He said, yes. Pause. So I'm a philosopher too. He said, yes, you are. Illiterate, can't read, but you are a philosopher. The experiment ended after the Minister of Justice ordered our expulsion from the prison following a Christmas concert put on and planned solely by the inmates, which brought together in song and drama all of what we had discussed in class. There was a fantastic play that they had pulled together that exposed the contradictions of justice and its intersections of class and power. And I never forget one of the, the strident moments in that play when a guy who had some skills in construction after being released went from job site to job site seeking work. And the word had already spread that he was a, a, a recidivist, he was a negligent. And um, in, when he left one site, the foreman called the telephone, the next site he was going to, to alert them that he was coming. So they knew this person had been in been to jail before. And the interviewer asked him, can you bend steel or steel well? So um, I wrote about this for my Caribbean studies paper at the University of the West Indies and actually got in 1978, I think it was, the University Prize for the University Prize for Caribbean Studies. But um, I had shared that study with Wilson Harris, who some of you may know, a noted Caribbean writer whose works of the creative imagination embraces an encyclopedic range of understanding from African and Amerindian philosophy to Jungian readings. And he sent me a personal letter after receiving a copy of the experience. And this is what he said in the letter, that it is here one is drawn into the necessity for a complex language of the imagination if one is to descend not only beneath the surface of the images in the original classes that you and your colleagues conducted, but beneath the lives of jailer and jailed and the paradoxes that unite them. Your intervention because of its intensity and curious pedagogy began to illuminate some of these paradoxes. Very Ferian, here it is. I think we can learn from the text that the people write not because of what the texts say, but because these texts, and I include the drawings, are set in peculiar momentum, as you have begun to do so effectively in your report, until they touch upon a hidden imaginative world 
that requires a conscientization and an illumination of strangeness that is unfamiliar to the parties involved. So all of this summarized was work done in, the, in a space that was a civil space. It was a group meaning well, wanting to help change society. It was a civic action. But the, to me, the key thing about Freire is that is what he has done, the way he has challenged the dominant education paradigm. Literacy education is really literacy plus conscientization, which equals reading the word in order to read the world and to act on the word, which is an inseparable dialectic. And I listened earlier to Ira's presentation, and that's core to what I think um, Ira, Ira was, was pointing to. So I move now to the Grenada experience, which really was for me a challenge of shifting Ferry's methodology of emancipation from the local and the non-formal to the institutional and the state. Because it's one thing to be sitting outside of the state, challenging the state, challenging the, 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 the hegemony of the, in the society. But it's another thing to be within the state, acting to undermine the, hege the, the pre prevailing hegemony in order to create a new order. One of the early visitors to Grenada following the revolution of March 13, 1979 was Paulo. Following my experimentation with his methodology in St. Lucia in the early 70s, I was invited by the People's Revolutionary Government to assist the revolution in designing and implementing a national literacy campaign. Naturally, the experience and the influence of the pedagogy of conscientization was brought into that process. So there is Paolo in Grenada. That's me, these are colleagues. This is my co-coordinator of what we call the Center for Popular Education, which was established to run the literacy campaign. And the other colleagues were officials of the ministry assisting in the establishment of the campaign. Paolo's, on Paolo's first visit, he was a feature speaker at a national conference on education, where he spoke at length on the perspectives on education. He had sessions with the Center for Popular Education team. And you can see immediately, even in the naming of that center, which was responsible for running the literacy campaign with a long-term vision of creating, turning every, after the campaign, we converted every school in Grenada and every community center into a, an adult education center by night. So the idea was that you can go from where you are to where you want to be. We have meetings with leaders, mass organizations, and discussions with the people. Parallel to the work done with Paulo was the invitation of a Cuban literacy advisor, Sinhel Angel Arechea, to participate with us in designing the literacy campaign. Angel's role was ready to help us with the logistics of the campaign, while I was responsible for the pedagogical aspect of the campaign. So, what did Maurice Bishop in that session with Paolo describing his speech as being the fundamental objectives of education in the revolution. He said, first, it attempts to teach people a greater critical appreciation of their own reality in order for them to understand how to change it. Second, it attempts to develop the innate abilities of the masses of the people and not just in entrenching the privileges of the few. Thirdly, it seeks to develop the productive capacity of our society, since it is only through an expansion in production that, that the standard of living, including the education system, can be improved. And finally, it tries to promote the democratization of our society. That is the process by which people are encouraged to take an active part in the education system itself and in all major decisions that affect our lives. And of course, one can see the resonances of Ferry and thought in this definition of objectives. Ferry's influence in the Grenada context was not just, was ideological and what I call textual. Um, because in the formulation of the work of the CPE, the, 
the objectives of the CP, the purpose of the CP was to assist in the conscientization of our people, to consolidate the presence of the people in the revolutionary process through the development of a critical awareness, to consolidate the right of the people to be informed participants in development through the eradication of literacy, understanding the nature of poverty and exploitation, and the acquisition of skills to build a new revolution in society. And finally, to assist in the redefinition of education and the formulation of a dialogical and revolutionary pedagogy. But I must say, when Ferry came to Grenada, he had by then published, I think he had just about published the work he had done in, in um, the Portuguese, in Portuguese Africa, the newly liberated states. So that also gave us um, a window of how the transfer of Ferian pedagogy from the level of civic action to state transformation could happen. And the books you see here are some of the posters and the books of the Develop for the Literacy campaign. The theme of the main literacy reader included, this is not the full range of topics, but let us learn together. We build our communities. The land must produce more. Our international effort, which was a major project of the revolution that Canadians had for decades been aspiring to. Our history of struggle and education is a must. And the approach taken in these was the dialogic approach as we did in the case of the prisons, to ask people to share their experiences. If we're learning together, what can we learn from each other? If we are a class of illiterate, does that mean we have nothing to teach each other? What, what, what can we share? What knowledge exists among us? And we just, you know, in the process, there were excavations of all kinds of things, folk knowledge of um, folk medicine, ethnographic material, all sorts of community-based knowledge, generational knowledge, cultural knowledge and traditions. Didacus, uh, you need to conclude a bit now. Okay. So yeah, building all of this and building social solidarity and community was also critical. The other areas of Ferry's influence on Grenada had to do with education as a focal point for mass mobilization, dialogue as a key to social cohesion, so to listen and to understand in order to act together, read the word, read the word, valuation of local knowledge. In one of the books we wrote about a, an illiterate a farmer who discovered a, a treatment for the Africa for the beetle that was destroying the, the cocoa plant, the cocoa plants. And we spoke about him, he was celebrated as an inventor. Gender equity and empowerment and legislation of rights were critical. Actually, parenthetically, someone mentioned earlier the Nicaraguan revolution and the conclusion of the literacy campaign. We sent two of our most outstanding volunteer teachers to Nicaragua as a gesture of solidarity to teach in the English speaking campaign in the Bluefields region of Nicaragua. Of course, I think everyone here knows how the revolution ended. And so it would be not correct to end without speaking to some prophecy that I believe that Paulo uttered in his visit to Grenada, um, because he's always spoken about the tension between ideological indoctrination as banking belief and the dialogic encounter, creating understanding. And notwithstanding the fact that many of the organs of popular power that, that are pictured here, the zonal meetings, the community meetings, the town hall meetings, all allow that dialogue to take place. The, 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 the orientation of the party in a, more, in a more authoritarian approach to Marxism ultimately led to the demise of the revolution. And Ferry, in a dialogue in 1980, when asked a question, uttered these prophetic words. He said, there's a dialectic between freedom and discipline. To the extent that you exaggerate freedom, you fall into anarchy. To the extent that you exaggerate discipline, you harden into authoritarianism. And so this is where I end, but um, it was an amazing journey. It was a powerful experience and the lessons of that have illuminated my life as an educator going forward. I was to end 22 years old at the time. And I learned from that 
the power of the words of uh, Raymond, Raymond, who we celebrate in a couple of days' time, Raymond Williams, that um, the duty of a radical is to make hope convincing rather than hope possible rather than despair convincing. I thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Didacus, um, for this wonderful um, final presentation. Uh, on a, you know, I mean, this is precisely what Paulo Freire is all about. Um, one thing I'm going to say, and we can open up the discussion now here, but latching on to this, uh, in 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 our in my country in Malta, um, as uh, any Maltese uh, knows here. I pushed hard, and I'm not the only one, um, the idea of schools as community learning centers. And uh, thanks to my uh, connections with Carmel Borch, who was very much involved in curriculum development. Uh, of course, he did not impose ideas. He was uh, part of the steering group. It was, there was a national consultation process. Uh, we got written into the various uh, curriculum development, national curriculum developments, the idea of schools of development uh, as, the, as, as community, um, schools, as community learning centers. Well, that idea, and I've written this, owes a lot to Didacus and the Caribbean experiment. I was struck by a paper he wrote about policy in adult education in small states to the extent that we published it in an anthology uh, in the... In the um, the same, the same series which Colin mentioned and showed you the publication of his book, publication of his book again. And uh, Didicus talks about this experiment, this idea taking root in Trinidad, Tobago, the idea of a multifunctional learning place, a multifunctional learning place which opens it up to the community, uh, remains with the community, but does not remain, sorry, does not remain there. You have to go a step further based on the Freudian idea of you start off with the existential situation of the learners in a collective uh, and uh, we, uh, this is an idea I've been pushing forward. Now, I think progress has been very slow. They depended on the EU funding at one stage, which is very contradictory and it got nowhere. And now I know there's an experiment taking place in Valletta, in the Valletta school, uh, run by uh, an experiment carried out by the, minister, the Department of Lifelong Learning, or whatever, the section on lifelong learning in the Ministry of Education. Anyway, we owe this to Didacus and the, and, the, and the Caribbean experiment. This is one way of linking in ideas. Often our ideas often come and, uh, at policy level from the colonial centers. Let's decolonize in this regard. Learn from the South. The South has a lot to teach. Not just Paulo Freire. Uh, Paulo Freire is one, one, one key figure. But lots of lots of lots of experiments and ideas, brilliant ideas, uh, which often get appropriated without any 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 acknowledgement whatsoever uh, by the by the Western powers, by the Western centers. Something that Boaventura de Souza Santos has been writing about, cognitive injustice. Anyway, um, our final conversation on the various themes we had in the final session. India, we've had a very international session. Uh, India, the Caribbean, uh, particularly um, Grenada and, 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 and St. Lucia. And uh, of course, come on, it's over to you. Um, uh, Finland, Scotland. Um, this, is your, this will be your final say uh, from Scotland. Colin, you have to be unmuted. You need to be unmuted. I can't hear you. That's it. Okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, you're I, right. I just wanted to really to thank the, the people who spoke from situations where they were in danger. And I'm thinking of Egypt. I'm thinking of uh, Turkey. I, 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 and and I'm thinking of other places in the world at the moment, like Russia and China and uh, what do you call Thailand? Is it Thailand and Brazil, where they are banning Freire's works? Now, what is that's in a sense 
what I'm trying to identify here is what's really going on. I, I, my earlier intervention about domination didn't really, and uh, the drive toward centralization, it, it didn't, I didn't put it very well, but actually here we've now got a situation where countries are being dominated by their own armed forces. Uh, and it's all, uh, uh, <coughs> this all ties up. It's very frightening, it's very dangerous. And we've got to find ways like Didicus has shown us, but given us a kind of hope and sense of possibility again uh, to, to move forward. And of course, Paulo ha had that experience himself in Brazil. It, it was difficult, it's dangerous, but you have to hold out for democracy. And democracy means all of the engagement of the people, not just representatives, the engagement of the people. And it requires courage and sometimes it does lead to sacrifice. So that's the way forward. Remember where uh, Peter and Paul, the founders of Christianity, whatever you think of them, they had the courage to head for the centre of power in the world then. And what, did, what happened? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were crucified. They were crucified. Yeah, but out of that courage, out of that affirmation of real values comes eventually improvement, better, betterness. And a change, a change, yes. Yes, um, right. Any other comments? No, I, I, um, I also, our colleagues, uh, I, there's a lot of bravery amongst, I can't get the picture right on my camera on. But anyway, there's a lot of bravery about some, some of our colleagues I mean, uh, danger is everywhere. Danger is everywhere. I mean, what, what Didicus must have gone through in, 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 in Grenada, but also uh, I think of our colleagues in Turkey. Yeah. And of course with uh, uh, Hassan, one of the things which strikes me about, uh, about critical pedagogues uh, in universities in Turkey is they all, when there are protests and the students are involved in protests against the government of some bombing uh, next to the Syrian border to put the, the blame on, 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 on the, Syrian, the Syrian rebels, I suppose, uh, causing, uh, causing uh, you know, loss of life. Uh, the professors are with them. They are with them. They get tear gas with others. You know, I mean, I mean this, is, this is quite powerful, I think. I'm not, I'm not dismissing the kind of work which takes, out in, takes place in other spheres, just like journalists were bombed in our country, you know, even universities, uh, we do have people, you know, being pilloried on on websites, far right websites, because of what we teach inside the classroom. I mean, there's this conception that we're sitting pretty in our offices. Well, you never know who your students are when you have, especially teaching undergraduates, when you have massive. There was a time when we had num huge numbers of students, and then you end up on websites, which is almost like an invitation to either throw something or burn your house or burn your car or, or throw paint on, on your walls, et cetera, or to, you know, like to identify you as an enemy. I mean, some people have had that. Some people have had their cars burned. Some have, uh, obviously, it's a matter of life and death, of course. And Paulo Freire, you know, is an example who faced that. And what, what I like about Paulo is this. He could have rested on his laurels when he returned because he proved himself. Nobody can accuse him of sitting pretty. Nobody could have accused him of that. And yet, what does he do? He takes, yeah. On, yeah. He takes on the onerous task. He takes on the onerous task of uh, becoming educational secretary chosen by the mayor in the municipal government. Where, you know, he can make, you know, he can make a fool of himself in terms of what he wrote. His, his reputation was on the line. He, he, he never shied away from that. He was also, as Ira Shore has pointed out to me several times, he was also moved by the fact that he was arrested precisely at a time when yeah. Brazil was roused for transformation. Yeah. Yeah. So. And uh, I was thinking about what uh, you know, the statement what? that I made that uh, Paulo Freire had Gandhi had this kind of you know knowledge about 
Paulo Freire and his yes. you know yes, come on. the kind of uh, you know theory about the people you know the cultural worker. Which, the, which thing is that? The case in India uh -huh. would have been you know fought much better. Yeah. Sorry, so there, is, sorry? Is, there is some interference going on. Yeah. So I was telling about, you know, about have, you know, not who's speaking. Not I'm not I'm not referring to you, Asoke, but anybody who's got this microphone hair or microphone on, please mute because uh, we cannot hear Asoke. Yeah, in this paper, this is the first time I made this comment that you know Gandhiji, he had fought against you know for the Dalits and for the untouchables over the years, you know, and he risked yeah. himself. But um, this, uh, uh, sorry, this uh, uh, Gandhi, you know, he, he did not have that tool. Only he had the tool of humanization, humanity. But that a cultural, that a scavenger or a sweeper is, is a better cultural worker than a professor is something you know would have given Gandhi a better you know equipment to fight against you know the untouchability against all forms of discrimination. You know this is the first time when I'm I was writing this paper. This thing came to my mind. I had introduced this concept before, but not in this you know perspective. And I I hope that you know the people who are the Dalits who are fighting for their rights can quote Paulo Freire and you know march forward with the thoughts of Paulo Freire that you know a, a sweeper or a scavenger or a person who is doing menial work uh, is absolutely a cultural worker as much as any other you know cultural worker the, from the elites. So this is what I thought that you know in this paper it is my contribution. Thank you very much. Um, this reminds me of Don Milani when he talks, I am not contributing to the education, to the education of children of peasants to free peasants from peasant work. What I want is a free peasant. In other words, not to, you know, to a free peasant, a liberated person, a, a liberated peasant who loves doing his her or his work, it usually used to be in, in those cases, whole families, basically, but to do it without, uh, without greater sense of control over their own environment and the rest of, uh, without harming others. This is yeah. important, with responsibility that is, yeah. you know? I mean, yeah, not right. the peasant from peasant work, from peasantry, but to have a liberated peasantry, which is different. True. I very much agree with you. I also to workers' education, etc., in its in its broader context. Any other comments? It's getting too dark, where night closes a tired eye. I was in Scotland. That was a Scotsman who used to sing it. Okay. Jack Bruce, God rest his soul. Anyway, yeah. Well, you're all tired, so am I. Actually, I had a look at the at the people who are in who's looking going around the scenes. We had quite an international mix over these three three days, huh? Yes, Peter. Peter from India. Hello. Yes. Hello, Peter. That's what I I just uh, pending a. Um... Uh, thank you to you and all the folks. Uh, it was from wonderful. Belgrade. I've seen from Belgrade. You know, from Canada, North America. It's wonderful. Two it's people. So I have, I'm just. I'm just joking. But two people. I'd like to. I don't know what's the word. I wanted them to join the Raymond Williams Fest. They're from Scotland, and one is Irish actually, but living in Scotland, and they never answered my emails, and now they're on. But anyway, we'll take that. We, you know, we'll just. Anyway, um, I think Hassan has his hand up. 
Hassan, where are you? There you are. Uh, first, I would like to thanks to all of you. I'm very glad to be uh, here uh, with you. I feel lucky. Uh, I hope we can meet uh, at any uh, a meeting uh, face to face. Uh, we can drink something, wine, tea, coffee, uh, with uh, good conversation, uh, with yeah. friendship. Uh, to exchange our ideas and the, uh, make it deep, uh, the, the deeper or stronger our uh, solidarity uh, and friendship. Also, I would like to make an announcement uh, if we are in uh, solidarity with our comrades, uh, colleagues uh, all from the world, all over the world. Uh, guys, Sinis. Guy Senis uh, from United States. Uh, he, uh, Guy Senes, Guy Senes, yes. Guy Senes. Guy Senes, yeah. Who they say? I, I, North, I, yeah. uh, Arizona University, he emeritus from, uh, joined the meeting. Uh, he is about uh, 70, uh, he says. Uh, joined a meeting. Uh, with Jesse Jackson, Je Jesse Jackson, uh, in uh, supporting voting right and the uh, teaching right of the teachers uh, regarding uh, all issues, because the uh, a, a pass uh, and and deal uh, passed uh, in there. If you say something, uh, discuss uh, someone, for example a person li uh, don't like to uh, be taught uh, on racism in the United States, teachers uh, will be punished because they don't want to uh, learn or uh, disseminate that kind of knowledge around the world or, or anywhere. Uh, so his, uh, his case will be uh, 70, uh, February, and the, uh, at the first trial, uh, first judge uh, decision uh, accepted to accepted to uh, letter of uh, letter, letter uh, of uh, court letter of court. There is a name of uh, that letter uh, can be acceptable. I uh, understood uh, some colleague from Turkey. Uh, we sent a letter uh, to support him that uh, he is our friends. Uh, only only uh, work for uh, good uh, of the people. Uh, then uh, teaching right is uh, main right. Uh, it's it is useful. Uh, uh, for for a better world, we 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 say and we uh, learned that judge accept that letter uh, to the case. It makes a uh, it makes a discussionable uh, case and a, a bigger case uh, in in this uh, region. So makes them uh, feel better, stronger, and maybe a case will be uh, good for the, for them uh, if you can have your support and yeah. solidarity. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. I, I yeah, uh, Guy Sinese is, is uh, yeah, he was arrested, manhandled because of participating uh, in a demonstration on democracy. In uh, in his uh, in one of the areas in the United States, that's very sad. Anyway, I think we, it's time now to conclude this 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 seminar. Thank you all for having contributed to it, and uh, it was a pleasure. Now I have to get my mind forward to Friday. I have to because we have an, a smaller one, a one day um, similar activity on Raymond Williams, uh, as I told you. Is also his the centenary of his birth, and uh, let's keep this going. Keep ideas coming as to where we can take this forward. 
you know, I mean, uh, you know, just write an email or uh, circular, um, just send an email to a number of people who are here or just write to us so that you can give us ideas. I'd love the where we go forward to come out of you, not just somebody plans something beforehand and we do it. So let's take this, this somewhere. Let's take this somewhere. Let's make it meaningful. More meaningful. It is meaningful, but let's make it more meaningful. Anyway. Um, Thank you, Peter. Have a good Christmas or festive season. I mean, those who believe in it, of course. And those who don't, they have their own festivities. Um, and uh, I don't know. We'll what, be in touch. What should I say? Yeah. yeah. Take care, Peter. Bye-bye. Yeah. Take care, all of you. Take care. And, and Peter. Remember what somebody told us about the fist. And <laughs> Peter. Yeah, solidarity. Okay, solidarity. But keep well, well, coming. May I, may I make a point, Peter? Yeah. Yeah. Make are you going to are you going to distribute or you know give it to us? We are. Um, um, uh, of course, uh, this is where Joe, Joe comes in. Uh, we will eventually, after editing, uh, yeah. we will uh, make uh, all the the recordings available. Right. And also, because also because the somebody, email address somebody. of all the, you know, participants, so that you know people can communicate among themselves. Yeah, that book that that that, that um, Juha is holding up is going to keep me occupied tomorrow. I have to write a review of it. Okay. It's Walter Cohen's book, which will be in the forthcoming next week, actually, issue of Postcolonial Directions and Education which is dedicated to Freire. And I can tell you, we have contributions by Henry Giroux, by Ira Shore, and uh, by other people, Taldor, who presented in this one, Ine Acioli, who could not participate this time for personal reasons, and uh, quite a few others. And of course, my book review, because I, as a, the editor of the journal, I'm not supposed to write in my own, in the journal of which I'm editor, but the book review, which I, I finished reading in the book, I finished reading the book in my on my trip to Britain last week. And now I want to find some time peacefully to sit down and write a review of that book. Anyway, cheers. And that is Paul, a statue of Paolo Freire or Parvo Nurmi. No, Paolo Freire. Okay. Wow. Yeah, I, I, in the chat, I... In I included the unedited recording of today. Okay, so you can you have access to an unedited, unedited, the unedited version of today's of today's session. Okay, through the Facebook page uh, of the Faculty of Education. Yeah. Okay, as a UNESCO chair will be promoting activities on these lines, not necessarily persons only, not just persons, but any kind of thing. And we are open to ideas, okay? Thanks. So, goodbye, good night. Cheers, good night. And uh, see you next time. Whenever that is. Cheers. All the best. All the best. Take care, bye. Bye.